Next, the final day of congressional hearings on federal actions in Waco, Texas. The House Judiciary and Government Reform Committees today heard from Attorney General Janet Reno. This hearing runs seven and a half hours. This hearing of the Joint uh, Committees on the Waco matter will come to order. This morning we are embarking on the last day of a series of hearings that we've spent nine, I guess, nine days all together looking at what happened at Waco, the who, what, where, and why. Today marks the end of our major effort to thoroughly examine the actions and events that led to the tragic loss of more than 90 lives of Branch Davidian compound near Waco, Texas, including four ATF officers and 22 children. We have heard from nearly 100 witnesses over a period of 10 days. We have achieved the primary goal I stated at the start, to give the American public an opportunity to review the events at Waco in a chronological and exhaustive manner, to hear the who, what, where, why, when, and how of this story. If not one new fact came out, and I believe many did, we accomplished something significant towards putting this awful tragedy behind us. At times, these hearings have produced more heat than light. It's regrettable that politics involves itself in oversight, but that is the nature of this business. Messy as it often is, I believe congressional oversight serves its vital purpose in the preservation of America's cherished heritage. I want to thank the members of these joint subcommittees for their endurance and their patience. I also want to thank my staff for the long nights of work. My chief counsel, Paul McNulty, Glenn Schmidt, Dan Bryant, Aaron Dunkel, Audrey Clement, and Tim Bidwell. I know they're going to enjoy the August recess. Today, we're honored to have Attorney General Reno with us. This is the second time she has appeared in this room to speak about what happened at Waco. The first time occurred less than two weeks after the fiery ending on April 19th and less than two months from when she was sworn in as Attorney General. We were still trying to figure out what happened at that time. Americans appreciated her willingness to accept full responsibility for the outcome and she has continued to show this exemplary character ever since. But now we have an opportunity to look at Waco with a much more careful eye. Everyone agrees that Ms. Reno was forced to make tough decisions and that she performed her duty admirably. None of us would have wanted to be in her position. Yet I know Attorney General Reno respects the fact that we must examine the soundness of her decision as part of our responsibility. Today we will question whether she was adequately informed about the status of negotiations at the time she gave approval of the gas insertion plan, whether she understood the certainty of an accelerated execution plan, whether she appreciated the unique nature of the Davidians and how they might react to the tanks and the gas. These are just some of the questions that we will examine. All of this will be for the purpose of avoiding such tragic results in the future. All of this will be for the purpose of restoring credibility to federal law enforcement. With that, um, I will yield to my co-chairman, Mr. Zeloff, and thank him for uh, all of the time that he has spent uh, on this, and it's been a pleasure working with you, Mr. Zeloff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, we, uh, I think it's almost unheard of the, the opportunity to have two subcommittees working so well together, and I appreciate your help. Today is the tenth and final day of the Joint Subcommittee's oversight hearings into executive branch conduct in the 1993 events near Waco, Texas. I believe that we have all learned a great deal. Certainly I have. Many of the conspiracy theories have been laid to rest, or should be. There is now clear confirmation that major and in some in important instances of, that were avoidable, mistakes and errors in judgment were made. These errors involved chiefly those who were higher up in the chain of command, and as we insist upon accountability, it is not the line agents who should be answering. Throughout this terrible affair, the line agents have distinguished themselves as disciplined, brave, and heroic. On reflection and review, I think it is clear that the responsibility, either by the decisions made or by the decisions not made, lies elsewhere. 
It lies with those who made threshold decisions or distance themselves from those decisions. It lies with those who are expected to be fully informed upon making or contributing to those decisions. It lies with those in whom all others place their trust and with those who are in a position to demand the right facts and to act upon those facts. Many Americans listened and wondered and tried to figure out what happened at Waco and why it happened and what the way it did and who was responsible for making the central decisions. We needed a sense of closure. When nearly 100 Americans die, including law enforcement officers, two dozen innocent children, and more than 60 others, in a preventable and arguably predictable nightmare, something is seriously wrong. How much more plainly do words come as written by Roger Altman in his striking memo of April 15th to Secretary Benson? Mr. Altman is not in the decision-making process, yet he sees the predictable nature of the tragedy. Quote, the risk of a tragedy are there, he says, unquote. Meanwhile, Mr. Smerick at the FBI writes four memos discouraging a shift away from negotiations to a tactical response. He writes until he feels that he has to change his recommendation because, in his words, under oath, he must please those above him, including the director of the FBI, Mr. Sessions. At the same time, warnings abound that use of CS gas in an enclosed area at high volume will be dangerous to small children. There are Amnesty International reports, a GAO report, expert scientific papers, even logs from the Ruby Ridge incident of eight months earlier, all blinking red danger signs. The Attorney General has resisted the use of CS gas perhaps on the same instinct that Mr. Altman has. Still, information comes to her that children are now being beaten inside the compound, information that is not new and which others will completely contradict. The Attorney General is either not informed or does not view as significant a peaceful resolution offer that is made on August 14th by, uh, I'm sorry, that's April 14th by Koresh and his lawyers. The offer is collaborated by the Texas Rangers. Detailed but largely verbal, the offer from Koresh suggests a shift in the way he perceives himself from being a martyr to being a messenger. Lawyers for Koresh and the Davidians leave a discussion with Jeff Jamar, who heads the FBI operation at Waco, thinking that they have all the time they need, the time necessary to get the writing done and complete the arrangement. Their own view is that it'll take 10 to 12 days. On April 15th, FBI negotiator Brian Sage talks for two hours with Webster Hubble, a close friend of the President's and number two man at Justice. Also on the conference call are Mr. Potts, Mr. Richard, and Mr. Clark of Justice. They are told that Sage and Jamar have received an offer from the Davidian lawyers. But Sage discounts the offer as not new and expresses his view that negotiations are fruitless. What they say to the Attorney General is unclear, but the offer is not pursued. Jamar has testified that he never got word from the Davidians that Koresh was actually writing and that if he had gotten such word, he would have called off the gas and tank assault. But he also admits that he never directly told the lawyers or Koresh that he would, not, that he would need to see proof of the writing or else a different approach would be taken. Meanwhile, the Attorney General gets a briefing book on the assault. She admits that she does not read the briefing book, the briefing book that sets out the final gas and tank assault plan. Even if the Attorney General had read the book, missing from it was Mr. Jamar's knowledge that CS insertion and the compound's destruction by tank would be accelerated. According to page 272 of the Justice Report, the Attorney General, without reading more than the chronology, either alone or in consultation with others, approves the CS gas and tank plan. On April 19th, as the plan predictably accelerates, she is either watching or does not stop it as she leaves for lunch at Baltimore. Eventually, while she is at the Baltimore lunch, the entire compound will burn to the ground. The children will perish. The lawyers for the Davidians who are given no advance warning speed to the scene as soon as they learn of the gas plan but get there too late. But accountability absolutely must mean that when information is brought to your attention, you do not set it aside and assume the best. Not to read the materials available in the briefing book or a matter of this magnitude, even if they turn out to be flawed or incomplete, seems to be unbelievable or at least careless. We will make public today a document that we will only be able to, to make uh, public in terms of excerpts. It is a White House document and it goes to an issue at the heart of the decision-making process. It is my firm view that on issues which clearly have, in Mr. Altman's words, the risk of tragedy, Responsible decision-making means insisting that all knowledge be placed before the decision-maker. It means digging for all the information and showing the foresight to err on the side of caution 
where uncertainties clearly exist and where less risky options, no matter how poor their chances of success, may exist. Americans are very forgiving people. When President John F. Kennedy attempted to resolve the conflict in Cuba with force and failed in the abortive Bay of Pigs incident, he did not dodge. He did not pass the buck to anyone else, not to his Secretary of Defense. He let it be known that he had, in fact, made the decision and that all the blame was rightly with him. The American people applauded his quick, honest confession, and the nation moved on. Where the American people are less forgiving is when someone says that a decision and responsibility lies elsewhere, but withdraws himself from the decision-making process altogether. Leaders do not dodge. They do not let others take the blame when they are involved or should have been involved themselves. While we have come back to this momentarily, I think it has to be said, and I think most Americans understand it intuitively, that there is a night and day difference between admitting that you were involved in a decision-making process, that you were part of a shift in tactics, especially if those tactics fail. As we try and tell the American people what happened at Waco, we must be able to tell them who was in the decision-making loop and who was not, who ultimately made the final decision which led to the tragic set of events. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zellov. Mr. Schumer, you're recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And today, of course, we will hear from Attorney General Janet Reno. And I, for one, am glad that someone of towering integrity like yourself, Madam Attorney General, is our last witness. Let me say that there are some very valid questions to ask the Attorney General. Why did she decide to go in on the 51st day of the siege, not the 40th, not the 151st? Who did she talk to about the effects of tear gas? Why did they use tanks? Who told her about the continuing risk of sex abuse inside the compound? Madam Attorney General, I guess this hearing must be somewhat frustrating to you. After all, you've been asked these questions again and again and again. But you also know, Madam Attorney General, I'm sure, that there's nothing wrong with asking them again and again because there was such a great loss of life. I'm confident that Janet Reno will tell us she gave the orders. She will also, I am confident, accept the consequences as she has from day one. Unfortunately, those watching these hearings may witness Tuesday morning quarterbacking, the likes of which we have not seen in a long time. If the Attorney General had waited past the 51st day, and David Koresh had decided to light the compound on fire because of some machination within his own twisted brain, you can be sure that Ms. Reno would be testifying before us today answering questions about why she didn't act faster and why the President didn't order her to go in sooner. We should not have a political witch hunt here today, and we will not allow charges to be leveled without fact. We will hear from some on the other side that the President was somehow responsible for the events at Waco. Yet there is not one shred of evidence that the President interfered with the decisions of law enforcement experts. This charge was part of a fishing expedition that came up empty. Some in the majority are twisting a few selected words in an internal presidential memorandum to fit their preconceived political agenda. The bottom line is that the chain of command worked exactly as it should have in this case. The president was given recommendations made by his top deputies who got their information from the top experts in their areas. He was informed of what went on but did not interfere unduly with their decision. We cannot allow people to twist this into some kind of sinister plot. Even the statements of my colleague, Mr. Zeliff, that the president didn't accept responsibility fly in the face of fact. A day after Waco at the president's press conference, he said, I accept responsibility, plain and simple. We cannot treat one person's innuendos as fact. If we do, we give new life to conspiracy theorists and those who seek to politicize these hearings. Let me also, on the 10th day of, the, of these hearings, lay out, the, again, the criteria by which we can judge them as a success or failure, at least in my judgment. On the first day, I said that these hearings will have been a worthy endeavor if, one, we bring out new facts, or if no new facts come out, we are able to look at the old facts in a fresh light. Two, 
we are given the opportunity to refute the baseless charges, accusations, and conspiracy theories that surround Waco, the issues mainly of motivation, not of action, and three, that the investigation is constructive and not destructive and divisive, that this hearing will create an ATF and an FBI that are stronger, better, and more effective at enforcing all our laws, including gun laws. Well, let's go over those criteria. First, while we have learned of some new details, no new major material facts about the incident in Waco have come out at these hearings. There is no doubt that the ATF and FBI messed up and messed up badly at Waco. Just ask the people who head these agencies. They'll not only tell you about the mistakes, but as you will hear today from Attorney General Reno, they will tell you how they live with the tragedy every day of their lives. Once the element of surprise was lost, the ATF should never, never have continued with the initial raid. And using armored vehicles to punch holes in the side of the compound was clearly counterproductive. On the second criteria, refuting baseless charges that some from the conspiracy theory industry have put out, I'm disappointed that some continue to treat misinformation and innuendo as fact. For example, this Sunday we heard that the government killed over 80 people at Waco. Fact. The government did not kill anyone at Waco. David Koresh is the killer. David Koresh is to blame for the tragedy. David Koresh, beyond any reasonable doubt, as our experts told us, lit the fire. The most important thing that this hearing taught us is that you cannot compare the mistakes of the ATF and the FBI with the evil of David Koresh. It is wrong to twist the facts, making law enforcement the villain and David Koresh the lawbreaker, the victim. Law enforcement made mistakes. They were mistakes of action, but not of motivation. They did not fire until fired upon, and they did not light the fire in the compound. They acted in good faith to enforce the law. They tried their best to save the innocent people in the building, although their best wasn't good enough in this case. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt, after all, looking at the monster they had to deal with. Every charge that we have heard regarding law enforcement's motivation in this episode has been completely put to rest. No one out in America should believe that there was an intention to kill David Koresh or any of the people in the compound because people didn't agree with his religious views or other types of activities. Another myth we've heard again and again is that tear gas, quote, killed Davidians, including children. Fact. The autopsy reports show that tear gas killed no one. The people either died in the fire set by the Davidians or were shot by fellow Davidians. And we need help from everyone in refuting outlandish charges and conspiracy theories while at the same time admitting that serious mistakes were made. I want to thank my Democratic colleagues who have been an effective truth squad during these hearings. You've done a wonderful job. I would also like to com compliment Chairman Bill McCollum for being a fair arbiter of these hearings. I believe he truly wants to get to the bottom of what happened at Waco, and I also believe we won't agree on everything. But when the evidence shows that a charge is baseless, he has no problem saying so. That takes a lot of courage and deserves a lot of credit. Charges about the ATF agents with Darth Vader helmets, similar to the NRA jackbooted thug comments, are not leveled anymore. I believe that's a result of our efforts to keep these hearings honest. The final and most important criteria in judging these hearings will be whether we leave with stronger federal law enforcement. On this point, the jury is still out. In some ways, the ATF and FBI are already stronger. You can bet that the ATF will not undertake another raid after losing the element of surprise. Interagency coordination has already been improved. Plans for serious situations like this will be reviewed far more carefully than they were in both the Treasury and Justice Departments. But more needs to be done. 
We still have not gotten a good answer to why Sarabin and Hoynotsky were, not, were, were reinstated. William Buford, the ATF agent, still says he feels like he did after coming home from Vietnam. Quote, I did a service for my country and was being criticized for it. Finally, and in the final analysis, we have to remember in this new world we live in, there are no certainties. We cannot be sure that future law enforcement activities will be flawless. But we cannot allow law enforcement to be so tied in knots because of past mistakes that they'll be paralyzed the next time. There are some who say, well, David Koresh had the 48 machine guns, and he may have done the child molestation, but he wasn't harming the outside world. Why didn't we leave him alone? Why did we have to go in? Why did we have to have such an operation against him? Well, I would ask everybody to remember that we are a nation of laws. If we let the next David Koresh act above the law, if we let militia members not even pay parking tickets or taxes because they don't like this government, we're going to see an increase in lawlessness. We will see even less respect for the government because it's our laws that we need. 200 years ago, our founding fathers engaged in a noble and wonderful experiment called the United States of America that is founded on our laws. We cannot allow anybody, no matter what their motivation, to escape from the control of those laws. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. As most of you know, uh, Karen Thurman, Congresswoman Thurman, who is the ranking member on Mr. Zeloff's subcommittee, uh, cannot be with us today because her husband had a kidney transplant, a very successful one, over the weekend. And so to give an opening statement uh, is the full ranking member of the full committee, uh, Curtis uh, Collins. Ms. Collins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And as you have said, um, uh, Karen is not here. And I want, uh, before I give my statement, to acknowledge the very fine work that Congresswoman Karen Thurman who is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice, has done on this particular uh, hearing. She has, in fact, done an outstanding job throughout these very lengthy hearings, and I think she deserves our thanks. And so I would ask unanimous consent that her statement be included at this point in the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, as these 10 days of hearings on Waco come to an end, I would like to make some general comments before turning to the remaining issues for today's hearing. As I said in my opening statement two weeks ago, I have always favored vigorous congressional oversight, but these hearings gave me cause for concern. Over the past 10 days, we have seen both the good side of these hearings and the bad. On the positive side, we've often received a clearer picture of the events and debunked the conspiracy theory. Early in this hearing, we were reminded who the real culprit of the Waco tragedy was, David Koresh. From Kerry Jewell's first-hand testimony that Koresh sexually molested her when she was only 10 years old, through the testimony of the ATF agents who were ambushed and repeatedly shot by Branch Davidians, to the expert testimony that Koresh and his followers started the fires that led to the deaths of 80 Davidians, we have learned that David Koresh must be held accountable for the Waco tragedy. Efforts to implicate the president and to blame the government rather than Koresh for the deaths of Waco are outrageous, offensive, and totally contrary to the evidence received at these hearings. Such irresponsible statements suggest that a broader political agenda is one of the driving forces behind these hearings. We've also refuted many other myths and conspiracy theories. ATF did not shoot the Davidians from helicopters, and there was no secret role for the U.S. military forces at the raid. The hearings have also tended to support the findings of the two major reports conducted by the Treasury and Justice Departments uh, into the raid. At the same time, many of the concerns I mentioned last week have proved to be correct and yet have gone unanswered. We had clear testimony from two witnesses that the NRA attempted to influence their testimony in these hearings. Yet this joint Waco committee has taken no actions to look into the charges. I was also concerned that after the bombing of federal workers in Oklahoma City, the anti-gun control advocates and the militias would use these hearings to attack supporters of gun control. And judging from the vicious hate mail that I and other members who support gun control have received, 
these organized efforts appear to be in full swing. Let me now turn to the issues for the Attorney General to address. It appears that there are three questions that have to be answered. First, why did the Attorney General agree to the FBI plan to insert tear gas into the Mount Carmel compound? Second, did she make the decisions on her own, or was she directed to do so by someone else, presum uh, presumably from the White House? And third, what was President Clinton's role? The first question is the one I am sure that Attorney General Reno has considered over and over again in her mind. We have received days of testimony on the safety of CS gas, the possibility of fires, and how the negotiations were proceeding. Some of this testimony was probably not available to the Attorney General at the time she had to make the decision, but some of the testimony, such as the science of CS gas, may have been more relevant to a rulemaking on whether to permit the sale of CS gas at the supermarket than to the decision to introduce gas in Mount Carmel. The reality for the Attorney General in the days leading up to April 19th injection of gas was whether the tear gas plan was the best option or whether continuing to wait was the best option. The scale of justice has only two sides. We must recognize that there were no other reasonable options. In this context, we must ask Attorney General Reno not only what she knew about tear gas and children, but also what she knew or might have feared would happen in the event of further delay. I find the second question, namely whether the Attorney General actually made the decision on her own or whether someone else pressured her to be an offensive question. Why wouldn't the leading law enforcement official for this decision make it? Why would, say, well, Webb Hubble or Vince Foster, whose names the Republicans constantly bandy about, make such a decision? First of all, I think it's clear time for us, all of us, to let that man, Vince Foster, rest in peace and his family to get on with their lives. But unlike those two gentlemen who spent careers in a corporate law firm, Attorney General Reno had been working with law enforcement officers for many years as a Dade County District Attorney. But whether she had been in office for two weeks or two years, she would have had a greater feeling for a law enforcement operation than any other political appointee in the, administ in the administration. So I wonder whether some of my colleagues question her role because they cannot imagine a woman taking responsibility for great decisions. The third question is what was the role of President Clinton? This is the most curious question of all because I have not seen any evidence that would contradict the conclusions reached by the Department of Justice reporting this issue. That report found that the President was kept informed about Waco and in particular was told by the Attorney General of the tear gas plan and that after questioning about the safety of the children, he only concurred in the decision. The report includes a letter from the President that explained these circumstances. The President stated that he was informed by the Attorney General about the tear gas plan. He described the questions he asked and stated that, quote, after asking these questions and receiving those answers, I said that if she thought it was the right thing to do, she should proceed and I would support the decision, end quote. On April 20th, 1993, the President at a news conference reiterated that he was informed of the plan, supported the plan, and took responsibility. Now, if the Chairman or anyone else has found evidence to the contrary of this account, I and the committee, I'm sure, would be interested, but I haven't seen anything yet to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Conyers, whom I believe has an opening statement you requested yesterday. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Madam Attorney General. I uh, want to let you know that uh, I'm really glad you're here this morning because you are the 94th witness in nine days, and your appearance signals that this is the end of the Waco hearings. I've been waiting for you all week. <laughs> it's wonderful, at last. Now, <clears throat> I've been questioning and arguing with attorney generals since 1965, starting with Nick Katzenbach during the civil rights days. And you are the first lady attorney general and I want to tell you that you're as competent and thorough and as well prepared as anybody. 
so that for everybody that's worrying out there what's going to happen to Janet today, you can sit back and get a cup of coffee because nothing's going to happen to her. She's going to tell it like she always tells it to me and everybody else. Uh, I like Chuck Schumer and Curtis Collins are very proud of the role that we on the Democratic side have played in this hearing. I mean, it's been tough enough even with us here, and I hate to think about what they might have been like. They've gotten quite out of hand. We're really out of gas, and so we're going to take you through not only all of their questions, but uh, dozens more that will be thought of on the seat of the pants. And uh, then we will be through with Waco. But what remains, Madam Attorney General, is the investigation of the militia, the uh, clans, the Aryan nation, the skinheads that are scaring the pants off millions of Americans all across this nation, some who live in rural areas that dare not say what I'm saying, and I had people in Michigan come up to me and tell me how grateful they were that, that we were asking for hearings on the militia. And out of the Waco hearing, and I want to praise Bill McCollum again and include Chairman Hyde in this commendation, we're going to have hearings on the militia. It is true that across the years, Everybody's taken a nod and a wink at these organizations with guns training out in the woods all over America. If those had been uh, black men training out there, we wouldn't have to hold hearings on them. They would, they would be surveyed, filmed, and, and uh, watched from morning, noon, and nighttime. But it's gone on, and the good thing about this is we're going to begin to look at them because people need that protection. As you know, coming out of the civil rights movement, uh, I've had a lot of criticism of the criminal justice system. The racism that you've encountered and fought and that I've encountered and fought is still there. In the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, in INS, in Customs, in DEA, in the Department of Justice, yes. We've got a lot to do to really make justice mean what it says. And you and I and others have to somehow get a hold of this prison building mania. We, we cannot build enough prisons to incarcerate everybody in America as a way to solve the crime problem. And so I'm delighted that you're here. I've, I look forward to your testimony and then an end to these hearings and it won't be a moment too soon for me. We, uh, thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Conyers. We have two more very short opening statements. The ranking uh, member of the General Re of the Oversight, Reform and Oversight uh, Committee, Government Oversight is wanting to give an opening statement because Mr. Klinger is absent, the chairman, and then Mr. Hyde, who is the chairman of the full judiciary. Mr. Schiff. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just want to make two points briefly. The first is to you, Mr. Chairman Zeliff and Chairman McCollum, I think as we come to the last witness here today, the Attorney General, the hearings have accomplished their main goal, which is to bring all of the testimony possible in, into the public so that the public can make up its own mind as to what happened. Second of all, I want to observe in fairness to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice that although there are legitimate questions that should be asked about the, uh, the, the handling of the siege, the fact of the matter was this siege was already in existence at the time the Department of Justice took over responsibility for this matter. The original raid by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was under the jurisdiction of the Treasury Department. And I think one of the things this hearing has already shown are a number of problems in the Treasury Department's management of the situation, beginning with the fact that they allowed the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to be fixated 
on the idea of conducting a military raid uh, style to execute the search warrant on the Davidian compound. Even though this was inherently risky to the, to the children inside the compound, as testified to by a case worker from the Texas Department of, of Family Services, to the danger to their own agents. And it goes to all the way to the other end with the Treasury Department that the number two person at the Treasury Department, Mr. Altman, when he heard about the FBI plan and had concerns, said it was a potential tragedy, passed it on to his boss, the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury basically did nothing on the memorandum saying it's not our responsibility anymore. That may have been legally the case, but the Secretary of the Treasury could have picked up the telephone to the Attorney General to make sure that this information got there. So, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say I think we have learned a lot at these hearings. I think they have been beneficial. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Mr. Hyde, you're recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, so taken with uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Conyers, because we served together on the uh, Judiciary Committee. He's the senior Democrat that I always follow carefully uh, what he says. And I even go back into the archives because I like to reread what he says. And uh, on April, April 28th, 1993, uh, in the one-day hearing, which I know suited the gentleman more than this eight, nine, ten days. He's a great encapsulator of, of investigative hearings. So under the uh, previous regime, we had a one-day hearing, April 28, uh, 1993, and the distinguished gentleman from Michigan said this to the distinguished Attorney General. Madam Attorney General, I'm extremely disappointed in the decisions that have been made out of the Department of Justice the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. In Philadelphia, we had a mayor that bombed people out of an eviction. In Jonestown, we lost the life of my colleague, Congressman Ryan, who tried to get Don Edwards to go out there with him because of a miscalculation about cult people. We had Patty Hearst and the Symbionese Liberation Army. We had Wounded Knee with the Indians. Now, when in God's name is the law enforcement at the federal level going to understand that these are very sensitive events that you cannot put barbed wire, guns, FBI, Secret Service around them, send in sound 24 hours a day and night, and then wonder why they do something unstable? The root cause of this problem was that it was considered a military operation, and it wasn't. This is a profound disgrace to law enforcement in the United States of America, and you did the right thing by offering to resign. You did exactly the right thing. I commend you for it. Well, I think it's useful to... to uh, that, a quick observation, please. I, I will, with pleasure, yield to my Thank friend. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm very flattered whenever the chairman quotes me. Now, I'd like him to... You should live in a constant state I, I of flattery. Like, I'd, I'd like the... I would like the chairman to uh, either support my remarks then or my remarks now. I mean, the choice <laughs> is yours, sir. Well, I love Byron, but I don't support him all the time. Uh, in any event, I just think it's important to, to get the fullness of the gentleman's views on these very important issues. Now, I will just say this. Against the background of Jonestown, and the available information about the millenarian apocalyptic beliefs of the Branch Davidians, information that I believe was largely dismissed by those in charge of this siege, I am increasingly convinced that this catastrophe was avoidable. Madam Attorney General, you were in office 38 days only, and you suddenly became the designated spear catcher for everybody in the administration. And I think you were imposed upon, but it was ever thus uh, in the uh, bureaucratic world. Your decision was only as good as the information you received to back it up. And for whatever reason, I'm convinced you didn't get adequately informed. The use of the CS tear gas is, is most revealing. It was done to drive the Davidians out of the building. But the theology that guided and animated them made them resist being driven out into the arms of the Babylonians. 
They were treated as hostages, but they never were hostages. Now, what good can come of these hearings? When dealing with religiously driven people, learn as much as we can about their beliefs and motivations. I can't stress that too much. A second quality is patience. Patience, something we all lack. I certainly do in abundance. The use of gas is designed to make people sick. We understand that and make them good and sick. Make them so sick that they cannot stand the premises where they're receiving the gas. And when children are involved, where infants are involved, it is a high risk that I don't think is worth taking. Little kids, little infants who can't care for themselves can get very sick, can vomit, can strangle in their own vomit, and I just think it's highly imprudent. Those are some of the things we can learn from this. There are many, many more things. This has not been an effort to denigrate law enforcement as such. Every member on this side of the aisle is proud of our police officers, in any and every branch of law enforcement. They do a very dirty, dangerous job with inadequate compensation. And we understand that and we honor them. But that does not mean we should forfeit our responsibility of oversight. And we have exercised that as, as best we could in this very important occasion. And again, um, Attorney General Reno, I think you have done an excellent job given the limitations that surrounded you just being in office for 38 days. That was a tough one. I think other people might have helped you more, and they didn't. Uh, I thank the chairman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hyde. I would like now, if the attorney general would stand to be sworn in, please. If you raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I didn't. Thank you. Please be seated. The record will reflect that... Uh, the Attorney General responded in the affirmative. At this time, uh, I want to uh, introduce the witness at this point in time. I have an introduction. And I don't know that you need to be introduced. I think we already know uh, that the Attorney General Janet Reno was born in the nation, was sworn in as the nation's 78th Attorney General by President Clinton on March 12, 1993. From 1978 to the time of her appointment, Ms. Reno served as the state attorney for Dade County, Florida. She was initially appointed to the position of, by the governor of Florida and was subsequently elected to that office five times. Ms. Reno was a partner in the Miami-based law firm of Steele, Hector, and Davis from 1976 to 1978. Before that, she served as an assistant state attorney and as staff director of the Florida House of Representatives Judiciary Committee after starting her legal career in private practice. Ms. Reno was born and raised in Miami, Florida where she attended Dade County Public Schools. She received her A.B. in chemistry from Cornell University in 1960 and her L.L.B. degree from Harvard Law School in 1963. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Three days after the Waco standoff began, David Koresh promised the FBI that he and his followers would surrender immediately after a tape he had made. Right, move closer. I don't believe we're able to quite hear. I know that's difficult with your... Thank you very much. Three days after the Waco standoff began, David Koresh promised the FBI that he and his followers would surrender immediately after a tape he had made was broadcast on the radio. The tape was broadcast. What did he do? He broke his word. He did not surrender. In fact, while the tape was being broadcast, Koresh and his followers were not gathering their belongings and preparing to surrender peacefully. Instead, they were busy rehearsing a plan to blow themselves up and take as many agents as possible with them by walking out of the compound with explosives strapped to their waist. On March 19th and 20th, Koresh said he would come out soon. He did not. In early April, he said he would come out after Passover. He did not. On April the 14th, he let his lawyers believe he needed only a few days to complete his manuscript on the seven seals, and he would then surrender. The FBI showed Koresh's April 14th letter to an expert at Syracuse University who concluded it was another ploy, another delaying tactic. 
But the FBI kept negotiating. They kept asking Koresh when he would finish the seven seals and come out. On April the 15th, the negotiators asked Steve Schneider, Koresh's second in command, whether he had seen any finished pages of the manuscript. Schneider said he had not. On April the 16th, the negotiators asked Stephen Schneider again whether Koresh had completed the first seal. Schneider said no. On the 17th, Schneider said he couldn't say whether it would be six months or six years. It's easy, in hindsight, to suggest the so-called surrender offer of April 14th was a missed opportunity, but we considered it carefully. We didn't dismiss it casually. Even though Koresh broke every promise he made, and even though he never gave the FBI any reason to believe he would surrender peacefully, the FBI kept negotiating, kept trying, every way they knew how, to talk Koresh into leaving. But he never gave them a specific date. When I took office on March the 12th, 1993, the most urgent issue I faced was how to bring the standoff to a safe and peaceful end. Remember why we were in Waco. Four federal agents had been killed trying to arrest Koresh and to seize illegal explosives and illegal weapons, including hand grenades, grenade launchers, and machine guns. We couldn't just walk away from it. Day after day, FBI negotiators tried to arrange a surrender. During the standoff, the FBI had 949 conversations with Koresh or his lieutenants, totaling almost 215 hours. At the urging of the FBI, the local sheriff attempted to get Koresh to surrender. So did several lawyers and others who were given extraordinary access to the compound. We faced an impossible situation. Koresh wouldn't leave. He had told the FBI as early as March 7th that no more children would be released. What to do next? We studied intelligence reports. We met with outside experts. The perimeter was becoming increasingly unstable with frequent reports of outsiders, including at least one militia group, on the way either to help Koresh or attack him. The FBI's hostage rescue team was nearing its seventh week at Waco and experts had advised me that they would soon have to be pulled back for retraining if they were to maintain their state of readiness. We checked on the Davidians' food and water supplies, and I was advised that they had provisions to at last up to a year. I asked the FBI to check the water supply again, and I was advised that the supply was plentiful and it was constantly being replenished. Clearly, a dangerous situation was becoming more dangerous, especially for the children. We had received allegations that Koresh had sexually abused the children in the past, including Carrie Jewell when she was just 10 years old. We had also received allegations that Koresh had physically abused the children. For example, a former Davidian alleged that Koresh had once spanked a young child for 40 minutes so hard that her bottom was bleeding. The child was only eight months old. During the standoff, the environment in which Koresh forced those children to remain continued to deteriorate. Human waste was being dumped into the courtyard. The FBI submitted a plan to use an irritant gas incrementally beginning at one end of the compound to shrink the usable space to induce Koresh to start letting his people go. I asked whether the gas could cause permanent harm, especially to the children and the elderly. Dr. Harry Salem told me, as he told you again last week, that CS gas was the safest, best studied tear gas in the world. He told me the gas would not cause any permanent harm to the children and the elderly. The April 19th operation began with clear announcements of our intentions, repeated time and time again, aimed at giving the Branch Davidians opportunities to leave safely. The Davidians responded with heavy gunfire from the tower and other parts of the compound. Yes. We had hoped the Davidians might not react violently if we used the gas in a slow, incremental manner, manner, but those hopes were dashed by the Davidians and their guns. Our response was measured. We inserted gas, then waited, then inserted more gas. We were very careful never to insert more gas than a fraction of the safe limit. Six hours went by, six hours, and still no one came out. The rest you know. 
The Branch Davidian's words were recorded while they spread the fuels used to ignite the fire that resulted in the deaths of all but nine. FBI agents risked their lives to rescue several of them. Others emerged through holes the tanks had made in the walls after it was learned that other exits had been blocked from the inside. We will never know whether there was a better solution. Had we not acted when we did, and Koresh had brought things to a sudden and violent finish as he had rehearsed, we would probably be here today anyhow, and you would be asking me why I hadn't taken action earlier, why we had not tried to use tear gas to resolve the situation. Everyone involved in the events of April the 19th made their best judgments based on all the information we had. We have tried as hard as we can to study what happened at Waco, to learn from our experience, and to make changes so that as we go forward, we can be as prepared as possible to deal with such future situations. Let me describe briefly some of the steps I have directed the FBI to take to improve our capacity to respond to complex hostage barricade incidents in the future. The FBI has selected a group of more than 30 senior agents for additional training in hostage barricade situations. And these crisis managers will be called upon to assist the on-scene commander during a crisis. This system was used very effectively in the immediate aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, and I am very proud of the results. The FBI is increasing the size, composition, and equipment of the hostage rescue team, or HRT, to permit the replenishment of resources and personnel during long-term hostage barricade situations. The FBI has increased the number of negotiators stationed at HRT headquarters, and additional training seminars have focused on identifying negotiating psychology and strategies. The FBI has formed a critical incident response group to deal with crisis situations. This group has also been used successfully in the investigation of the Oklahoma City bombing. In addition, they have provided training to key officials in the Department of Justice and the FBI. The FBI's special weapons and tactics, or SWAT teams, are now better able to assist the HRT in a crisis. The FBI has increased its SWAT team capabilities. There are now 19 enhanced SWAT teams strategically placed around the country. SWAT teams now cross-train with the hostage rescue team, and the SWAT training unit is now under the direct supervision of the HRT commander. The FBI is in the process of, establish of establishing a long-term relationship with the crisis resolution centers at both Michigan State University and George Mason University to call on their behavioral science expertise during a crisis incident. The FBI has also created a resource list of experts knowledgeable about both mainstream and non-mainstream religions and will be in a position to tap both their expertise and their contacts within the religious community in the event of a future crisis. The FBI is continuing its research into non-lethal and less-than-lethal technologies, such as CS gas, as alternatives to the use of deadly force. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman McCollum, Chairman Zeloff, and the members of the subcommittee, this was the hardest decision I have ever had to make, probably one of the hardest decisions that anybody could have to make. It will live with me for the rest of my life. I'm accountable for it and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Reno. Uh, I will start the questioning by yielding myself five minutes, and we'll proceed under the five-minute rule. I'd like to know if you had any evidence, if you had had any evidence, might be a better way of putting it, on April 17th, the day you approved the tear gas attack on the Branch Davidian compound, that Korish was actually writing his seven-seal manuscript. Would you have waited a few more days? There was consideration that we were told that he was writing it. Um, what we were faced with was March 2nd, he said he would come out. He didn't come out. After that, I came into office and was aware of that experience, aware of what he said all along the way, because they kept telling us what the process of the negotiation was. When I heard that before Passover, he said he would come out after Passover, I counted the days so what we estimated was the end of his Passover, just hoping, praying that he would come out so that this matter could be successfully resolved. But just as Passover ended, he sent out a letter saying, no, I'm going to wait and 
to explain the seven seals and then I will come out. I was advised during that whole time after the, the letter of the, April the 14th that the FBI had sent that letter to one of the experts that it had relied on over time trying to understand the letter, the religious implications and otherwise. We were advised that people were trying to find out whether he was serious and the best we could get from Steve Schneider was, it may be six months, it may be six years. And what I was faced with in that situation was a situation where the whole perimeter was becoming far more unstable, where people were concerned that he might, instead of waiting as he did to set fire, where he might carry out the plan that he had rehearsed, which was to exit the facility with explosives strapped to him, take agents with him, and while the others committed suicide inside. What I was faced with, considering all the options, was that at this moment, we had the best situation, the best opportunity to resolve it. Well, let me come back to this point. Mr. Jamar, Jeffrey Jamar, the tactical commander of the operation for the FBI on the site, had testified before us over the last week or two that had an actual piece of paper, some portion of this manuscript been brought out, he would have recommended to you to wait. And what I really was getting at by my question was not the background, though I think it was appropriate for you to give it, but it had that piece of paper been in your hand, had you had some physical evidence he was really writing, would you have waited? If you look through the transcripts of the discussions had with both Koresh and, and Schneider, they were asking, is can you give us something? Can you yes, give us yes, the Yes, ma'am, but if you had had it, would you have waited? I'm not asking you whether you had it. Obviously, they didn't have it. I'm not going to quibble with that. One would, of the would things you have I haven't done is do too much Monday morning quarterbacking, right. but what but, I am saying is that we were asking for some tangible evidence, something to show that he was, well, as well, a matter of good faith, proceeding. And if he had come out with a letter saying, yes, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to tell you when, that would be one thing. If he had come out with the first seal and said, see, I did the first seal in two days, just as I said I was going to do, I wouldn't have gone forward. Well, well, let me give you the background of the way I see this and why there are some who ask a serious question about this. In the transcripts of, what, of the negotiations over the final few days, the 16th, 17th in particular, it's very clear that David Koresh had said he was working not only on the first seal, but that he had completed that, it just hadn't been transcribed, and that he was nearly completed the second seal. He also said that after some discussion, he had wanted to bring the entire manuscript out as a whole. But he agreed on the 17th of April that he would produce a single manuscript, what he had, had completed once he got transcribed. That's the first time there's any acknowledgement of that fact or that he had made that agreement. Then on a, a little later discussion of the same day, later in the afternoon, it became clear that Judy Schneider is supposed to be typing this, didn't have any batteries for the typewriter or typewriter ribbon. One of the problems was they had no electricity because the electricity had been cut off by the FBI. Now, knowing that, and then knowing also what uh, Dr. Myron, uh, Murray Myron, who was the expert of the FBI, said in a memorandum on April 15, 1993, to the director of the FBI, and I quote, it is apparent that the muse, that's Koresh, uh, uh, that the muse is upon him and that he is feverishly working on his manuscript. He can be expected to value these writings in the highest regard their publication, dissemination, could be a powerful negotiating tool. Some would say that knowing those things that I just said to you, or at least if you had a flavor of this, in any sense of the word, that you had an obligation to do more than simply ask Mr. Hubble and others to talk to Mr. Sage on the phone on the 15th to discuss the negotiations, that you should have immersed yourself in this issue, and that you should have actually made a telephone call personally to Mr. Sage, the chief negotiator, to Mr. Jamar, the tactical commander, and to the attorney, Mr. DeGarren, for uh, the, uh, Mr. Koresh, and discuss this yourself before you made this absolutely critical decision that the negotiations were at an impasse, which I think you did make based upon everything given you. Can you tell us why you did not choose to personally make phone calls with, about such an important, critical question to any decision you're going to make? Because I was being advised, I had been advised of Mr. Myron's statement. And when you read the statement, Mr. Chairman, you should read all of it, because it says, in sum, I do not believe that there is in these writings any better or at least certain hope for an early end to this siege. 
he talks an awful lot more, and, and I would like for the whole statement well, to be... Well, we certainly need the whole statement to the record, And, and I think Reno, it's and important, I'm aware of that. As, as we go Without through objection. this, to, to try to see the bigger picture. What we were told about was a man who, on March the 2nd, added to a tape that he wanted broadcast an addition saying, I will come out as soon as this has been broadcast. He did not come out because he then said God had told him to wait. What I tried to do was to make sure that I was fully informed. From what I have heard, I was fully informed of what Mr. Sage thought. I read Dr. Myron's statement. I tried to understand. And what I was faced with was a situation where the negotiators said, we think we have reached an impasse. Nobody else is coming out voluntarily. We looked at the entire situation and we made the best judgment we could. I'm very satisfied that in the information furnished to me by the FBI, I was informed. Thank you very much, Ms. Reno. My time has expired. Mr. Schumer? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Attorney General Reno. Uh, first, I would like to ask you a couple of questions about the President's role. I didn't think we'd be asking those here, but uh, since we've had so many innuendos and allegations, I think we should put them to rest. So I have two specific questions, which if you would, you could answer concisely, and then a more general question. First, did the President change any material aspect of the plan as developed by the Department of Justice and approved by you? No, he did not. And second, did the President or anyone in contact with the President pressure you in any way or in any way suggest that you should speed things up to end the siege? No, he did not. Thank you. And the third question, which is a general question, is what precisely was the President's role in the development and approval of the gas insertion plan? I appreciate that opportunity to address this issue because it's very important. People somehow or another equate the President's role as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces with some similar role in law enforcement. But law enforcement has a very interesting function, which is in many instances quasi-judicial, so you do not want the executive directing and controlling for political purposes or otherwise the law enforcement function. I tried to do everything I could to make the best judgment I could as what has been characterized in the position of Chief Law Enforcement Officer of this country. I wanted to make sure it was done the right way. If we were conducting a political investigation, an investigation of, of some public official, you wouldn't be asking me or people wouldn't have been saying that the President should intervene. Clearly in this situation, we did it the right way. We conducted a law enforcement review. We made a law enforcement decision. I advised the president. He asked good questions and said he was going to back me up. Did he back you up? He certainly did. There was no running away from it or anything of that sort? I've told you but in the same room before, um, I got two phone calls when I got home the night of April the 19th, the early morning of April the 20th. The first was from my sister and the second was from the President of the United States. One I had known for 52 years and she was prejudiced. The other I had known for about a month and he was as supportive. Thank you. Okay, next uh, question. And just before I do, I would just like the record to show, I have great respect for my colleague from Illinois, Mr. Hyde. But I'd like the record to show that there was no evidence of any vomit found uh, as a way of the children uh, dying as a result of the tear gas. First, vomiting is very unlikely as a result of tear gas, as our witnesses stated. And second, there was no evidence that that was the method by which these children, terribly unfortunate children, died. The next question I have is a more general question. And this also relates to the, my colleague from Illinois and others. They're talking about we should understand more about religious groups and how they function. One of the criticisms made of you is that since you didn't understand how these religious groups work, you made an incorrect decision. Sometimes I wonder, you know, when we hear about inner city robberies and things, when the, the other side seems to rise up when people sometimes on this side would say we should understand what led these kids to break the law. 
My view is whatever happened in people's backgrounds, on either way, you, if you break the law, you suffer the consequences, period. Uh, but nonetheless, could you please uh, tell us in your mind how you weighed the fact that this was a religious sect with hardly conventional views? And second, in your mind, as you had to make that very important and awful decision, what in your mind was the consequences of waiting them out, just sieging it and waiting and waiting and waiting and not taking the action to insert the gas? I think and that's my final question, so you can ask and answer it as long as you want. I, and I think it's important to understand it in the whole context, because one of the issues that has troubled people is that they see a piece here and not a piece here. If I answer the question in one way on a specific issue, then the New York Times will say, oh, they wouldn't run out of food and water, not realizing that we had investigated that situation to learn that they had up to a year's supply of food and that the water was being constantly replenished without the proportion to the rain. So let us look at the whole picture. The first thing I was confronted with was the gas. What to do about that? And I, my first reaction was, what about the elderly? What about the children? It is very specific in my mind as to how I asked that question, because I had come to Washington in February. My mother had died the previous December. She had suffered from lung cancer for four years. I took care of her. She also had emphysema. And the image that I had as I first confronted the issue of the gas and people's description was, what if she had been detained against her will? How would that have affected her? And I kept going over it and over it again with her in mind. The other image that I had that was so vivid was I had a brand new 11-month-old grandniece who had come to Washington to see me sworn in. And my reaction was, what do I do about somebody like Kimmy? What is the answer to that? And I kept going through it and saying, I can't do this. That's when the issue arose, and I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Salem. And we went through it. He said that he had consulted with the pediatrician. I was told that he was the foremost toxicologist in the country. He addressed my concerns, but those were so vivid in my mind because I saw two real live people who I had to consider what the impact would be on them. What I have tried to do in terms of, and I realize this is far afield, but it's, it's important to see the whole picture. What I've tried to do as people, including our experts that we asked to be involved, has raised questions about the gas, is to try to do everything I could to make sure that we were as fully informed as possible. In meeting with Dr. Salem, representatives of the military's Delta Force were also there, and they started talking and we started reviewing the plan and we heard their views. One of the concerns they expressed was whether the HRT team, after 51 days on the line, could maintain its state of readiness, and they said they would pull, if they were in the same situation, they would pull them back. That caused me concern because I had been advised that the perimeter was unstable that people, there were intruders, there were threats of people coming either in either to attack or to assist. So I had to look at that. I meanwhile looked at the status of negotiations as I explained to, to the chairman. You have no idea how I counted the days and woke up the morning that Passover was supposed to be ending hoping that we would receive some tangible word that he was coming out. And I followed the negotiations. I considered the, the letter of April the 14th, I looked at Dr. Myron's statement. And we call SAGE, and I think there is a, a clear understanding of, of what had been, what we had gone through. I then tried to figure out what else I could do. How much food? They couldn't have that much food there. And then I learned they had purchased these MREs, these military meal ready programs or something. And they had perhaps as many as 50,000 of those and a lot of other foodstuffs and they could last up to a year. On the Title III, somebody mentioned that the Title III, the electronic surveillance that was in the building indicated that they might be low on water. I specifically called Ray Yan to see 
just what the situation was. The FBI went back and checked it again and found that the water was being replenished. I said, isn't there something that you could distribute through an airplane and just fly over and put them to sleep for an hour while we go in and get them out and was told that there was no technology that could be provided. I talked about tunneling and that seemed, based on all the information that was provided to me, too dangerous in terms of the explosives that were in the compound and what might happen. One of the things that haunted me was the whole problem of suicide. Of this millennialist theory that Chairman Hyde has referred to. We went back over it. I looked at everything. I looked at Dr. Myron's statement. I tried to understand. I even went to the book of Revelations myself trying to understand. And clearly, Mr. Chairman, that was a possibility, as I told you two years ago in April, a possibility that haunted me, and I kept coming back to it. But what I was faced with as I understood his his statements, and as the experts had said during the course of the whole 51 days, this may indicate that he wants to bring it to some explosive end. We had the information after March 21st that they had hatched and rehearsed a suicide plan early on that could also result in the deaths of agents. But I said, if it's that, I mean, if that possibility exists, how can we go forward? What they told me was that on a number of occasions they had talked to him and he had said, no, I'm not going to commit suicide. They had, he had specifically discussed that with him. He said, it is not in my teachings. So we knew it was a possibility, but what I was faced with was all my experts telling me that the siege wasn't going to be over anytime soon with Steven Schneider saying that he might be in there for six months or six years before he finished the seal. This man who had already broken his promises. The FBI told me that they were at that point in the best state of readiness possible to try to bring a peaceful resolution to it. And faced with all the circumstances, I determined that we should go forward. But it, we clearly consulted and understood the religious implications. I mean, that is consistent throughout all the materials uh, that we talked about, that it was clearly one of the factors that was considered. We want to do everything we can for the future to make sure that we're capable of doing that. That does not mean that the FBI should be collecting information about religious groups. I don't think anybody on this panel wants that to happen. But we have got to and we have identified religious experts in various areas that we can rely on for the future should we ever have to face it again. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. Thank you, Ms. Reno. Mr. Zellup, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, General Reno. Um, I reviewed, and if the clerk would put, pass out copies and put up the chart, uh, a memo from Mac McClarty, the President's then Chief of Staff to the President on March 1st, 1993. The memo summarizes a call the Chief of Staff made to the Acting Attorney General where he discusses the FBI's and the President's philosophy of negotiating until a resolution is found. Unfortunately, the White House has refused to give us a copy of the memo, but has allowed us to quote the sentence of greatest concern. The memorandum states specifically, and I quote, the Acting Attorney General con uh, concurred fully with your philosophy regarding this matter and assured me that no significant action would be taken without White House approval, unquote. General, I consider the use of military tanks and tear gas to be significant action. Can you state whether you specifically obtained White House approval or whether you simply advised the President without getting his approval, or is there a difference? Uh, backing you up, is, is that the same thing as approving? And in other words, how do the American people hold their leaders accountable if the President plays no role, role, no role in a siege of 51 days? Mr. Chairman, I think that the American people want to make sure that law enforcement conducts itself without regard to influence from those outside law enforcement except when it is appropriate. Clearly the President had talked with the Acting Attorney General before I took office and had been advised by the Acting Attorney General of the plan underway to try to peacefully resolve the situation. He told the Acting Attorney General that if the plans changed, to let him know I followed that direction and advised him as I think I should have advised him on something that could affect national concerns. 
but we advised him based on a law enforcement judgment, not a political judgment, not a judgment of the White House, but the decision was made in the law enforcement arena where it should be. We yep. have got to make sure that we, and it, it, it involves both the President and the Congress. One of the most difficult roles that I have faced is how do I respond to Congress in an appropriate way? Because of time, if I could just, I, if, I apologize. If okay, and then when you're through, I'll okay, finish. That, because then we can go on okay. towards the end here. You can add anything you'd like. Uh, the problem that I have here, if, if the President said to you, Attorney General, I don't like this gas plan, please do not move forward, would you move forward anyway? As I will go on and finish now, what I wanted to do was to make sure that I had considered everything in a law enforcement arena. I presented it to him. He asked good questions. If he had said, I am concerned about gas, what, a, what about it? That's exactly what he said. And I told him what I had done in the law enforcement context, consulting through the FBI to find out what was the appropriate step to take. Do you, do you think that that memo indicates that, that he has an interest? I mean, nothing will be done without his approval. Does that mean that nothing will be done without his approval? Which? That, the memo right up, up there. I don't, you'd have to ask Mr. Gerson about okay. what, Let me just ask you two things, and because of time, but, but ways, and then clear. let you take as much time as you want to answer. It. And, and mm -hmm. our problem here is, okay. is that, that we have very little time. Um, I posted a memorandum written by Deputy Treasury Secretary Roger Altman to Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson discussing your potential decision to use CS gas as a means to end the Waco siege. In his memo, he states that, and I quote, my rough guess is that she won't approve the use of gas. The risk of tragedy are there, and if the FBI waits indefinitely, Mr. Koresh will eventually will concede, unquote. Mr. Altman wrote this note after he was briefed by Justice Department officials. Why did he walk away from a Justice Department briefing thinking that the gas was unsafe and that Koresh would concede while you walked away deciding that all hope was lost and it was time to use the gas? And then the other thing, I, and, then, and then take your time and answer both, if you would. As you know, I've asked uh, questions about the chain of command as it relates to decisions made to the U use of CS gas as a means to end the Waco siege. I don't mean to suggest that there is some sinister plot by the White House, but I do believe that the American people have a right to know who is in charge and who is making major decisions during the, the administration. I posted several statements made by either yourself or the White House, and let me read these to you. I, and, and are they also passed out? I approve the plan and I'm responsible for it. The buck stops with me. This is you. This was from Washington Times on April 21st, 1993. I was aware of it. I think the Attorney General made the decision. I knew it was going to be done, but the decisions were entirely theirs. This is from President Clinton on the same day, April 21st, 1993. And the last one, the buck stops here. This was a sign on President Truman's death. Uh, my question here, Attorney General, can you please explain why these statements are so diverse? When military weapons are turned on American people, who makes that decision? Where exactly does the buck stop? And if you, I know there are two or three questions in there, and, and please take as much time as you'd like. Okay. Let's go back to the first point that you are, were asking about. Uh, if you'd put that back up, please. As you may recall, Congressman, uh, the, I was somewhat delayed in getting into office and was not sworn in until March 12th. Mr. Gerson was an acting attorney general who had served in the previous administration. And I think clearly the president was concerned about the fact that he did not know Mr. Gerson and had not nominated him for the office in the sense of of a permanent person representing the president and wanted to make sure that there was a clear line of communication. With respect to the second matter, uh, you indicated that Mr. Altman had walked away from a briefing. Um, I'm looking for that, but I don't see any walking away from a briefing. But. Sure, doesn't it indicate that he was at a briefing? My rough, he talks about this, my eyes aren't, 
probably as good as left. It says, Ron Noble informed me that the Attorney General is weighing a request from the FBI to use an advanced form of tear gas on the compound in Waco. Among other things, this gas doesn't dissipate. The FBI, and it goes on, I don't see that he walked away from a briefing. My guess is that she won't make the decision. The risk... I w I'm happy to address the that, but I don't... The risk of tragedy are there. But and what I wanted to make clear was I don't see any reference to Mr. Altman walking away from a briefing. What I was faced well, with was a considerable briefing. I've outlined to you the briefing over several days that I was involved in. I weighed what Mr. Altman and everybody else faced with that situation would weigh. And as I indicated earlier in my response to Mr. Schumer's question, I tried to do everything I could to come up with the right decision based on all the factors involved. With respect to who is in charge, I have consistently said that with respect to law enforcement matters, it is important that neither Congress nor the executive interfere in terms of any inappropriate involvement. That means that the Attorney General and the law enforcement apparatus of this country should function in a nonpartisan, thoughtful way that you and Congress can have competence in and that the President can have competence in. That is a very difficult task to walk but, and a very difficult line to walk, but I have tried to do it every way I know how and to make informed law enforcement judgments. With Did respect, you said I might answer. With respect to the use of military weapons, these, med uh, these uh, pieces of equipment were unarmed, as I understand it, and were contracted. I mean, it was like a good rent-a-car. Uh, they were rent -a, a good rent-a-car? A tank going into a building? Uh, these tanks were not armed. They were not military weapons. And I think it is important, Mr. Chairman, as you deal with this issue, not to make statements like that that can cause the confusion. These tanks were used to protect FBI agents who were on the front line, who were exposed to men who had killed four FBI agents, who had, ATF agents who had wounded 15, who we knew were armed with very high-powered weapons. I don't think you would want them to be unprotected, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I don't. Could I make one comment well, relative to Mr. Altman? Your time has expired. Mr. Altman's testimony. He test Mr. Altman testified last week under oath that he did get in. He, he was brief. Order, order. Mr. Zellif, your time has expired. Mrs. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General, let me just say that uh, we, we all know that um, everybody's been speculating on the other side about what happened and all of that, but the President gave a three-page statement about what happened, um, and I think that statement was... Um, Yeah. It was on April the 20th. It's a three-page statement, and in that statement he talks about the conversations that he had with you, etc., and that uh, uh, he was going to follow uh, whatever uh, action you wanted to take. And so I'm requesting that the entire three-page statement be made a part of the record, Mr. Chairman, and asking unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, let's get back to, uh, if you will, the, uh, thank you, if you will, the, um, matter of the tanks. You know, uh, I have here uh, in, the, um, in the Journal Gazette on Wednesday, July 19th, there was a story. It says that Mr. Souter sees uh, help in Waco hearing, and in it he says, the only law that they clearly established, Koresh, broke that I can see so far, is he had sex with consenting minors, he said. Do you send tanks and government troops into the large sections of Kentucky and Tennessee and other places where such things occur? Since Koresh viewed he was married, which then comes to the polygamy question. In other words, we're sending tanks in to enforce polygamy laws. The children and their parents didn't object to Koresh having sex with the girls, Souter said. And so the question is, to what level do we try to enforce laws against sex with minors? The question is, isn't it, as you have said, whether or not these men were fired on before and whether the, uh, and they knew there was a danger, and so that tanks should have been used. I think it's important that when you consider the use of tanks that they be considered as vehicles providing the 
armored capacity to prevent the pre penetration of, of these, this ammunition that we knew Koresh had. I can't speak to whatever was done prior to the time I took office, but clearly with respect to the day of April the 19th, I could not put FBI agents out there exposed when I knew what these men would do and when they started immediately to fire on the FBI. That's just wrong. Let me uh, ask you another question. On the, uh, one of those opposite boards they had up there was a statement, I think it was the first one they had up there, about uh, what all was supposed to happen and, and this and that. And could that first uh, board be put back up there again? Yeah, that's the one right there. You know, now we've, we've talked about that before, and I think it's interesting that Mr. Zellov would uh, re refer to that statement because right here in the Washington Post on July the 13th, he said, there was no smoking guns found in the Waco siege documents. That's the headlines on that story, and in the story he says, quote, there's no smoking gun, end quote, Representative Bill Zellef, Republican of New Hampshire, said last night after spending more than three hours examining the documents and copying them in longhand. He said uh, he and other House members who viewed the documents were not allowed to make any mechanical copies, but nonetheless, he said, there was no smoking gun. So then my reason for uh, bringing this up is the fact that he seems to think that um, he contradicts himself, obviously. No, 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 no. You, you can't refute what you are. I mean, it's in the paper, you know, and you know whatever the paper says is right. <laughs> but let me say this, Madam Attorney General, I really feel that uh, you've done a tremendous job here, and, and I don't see anything at all that refutes the information that you have given before, that the President has said in his statement, and I'm still waiting for somebody anywhere on the other side of the aisle or this side of the aisle to uh, show any reason whatsoever that whatever you have said or the President has said has been contradictory. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Collins. I recognize for five minutes Ms. Ross Leighton. Mr. Inquiry. Who, who's seeking? Oh, right yes, here. Mr. Wise. And mine is simply a question of procedure. Is it the Chair's intention to, is it a ra one round of five minutes per, uh, per panelist, or are we going to, I'd heard a rumor of two rounds earlier. Uh, the intent now is to complete one round. If necessary, we will do two rounds. You should expect that as a probability at this point, that there will be two a, rounds. A problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Ross Layton, you're recognized for five minutes, and I'll restart the clock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Attorney General, it's a pleasure uh, uh, to be with you today. I've had the, uh, the pleasure of having worked with you for uh, more than a dozen years uh, as uh, fellow South Floridians on the myriad of issues that confront our communities in, uh, in South Florida. I've always found you to be an honest and uh, straightforward person, and I know that uh, uh, you are uh, uh, doing your best in your new capacity uh, in this job. As South Floridians, we're also very anxious about our, our families and our neighbors uh, uh, today and tonight as another hurricane uh, uh, awaits them. And so we pray that, uh, that everything goes fine uh, for our loved ones uh, down there. Uh, and as South Floridians, we share a common concern about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the harm done to all of our communities by, uh, by the drug trade. Uh, to help uh, combat uh, this problem, Congress has uh, has authorized the military to assist in these uh, anti-drug efforts. Uh, I'm very concerned uh, about the misuse uh, of that authority by, by an agency that wants to treat the uh, defense budget as, uh, as free money above and beyond what uh, Congress has uh, allocated uh, for that agency. Uh, we heard uh, in our uh, hearings uh, from Mr. Wade uh, Ishimoto, who was an outside uh, expert uh, brought in to critique uh, the planning of the initial raid, and Mr. Ishimoto stated in, in his report to the Treasury that uh, ATF believed that a drug nexus uh, was uh, necessary to obtain uh, military support. He later stated that the drug nexus was uh, tenuous at best, and the committee provided him uh, access to a document which stated that the drug ne nexus was in fact made up. And my questions uh, deal with this issue of the, uh, the drug nexus. Do you agree that, uh, that such deceit uh, not only undermines the, uh, the reputation of law enforcement, but uh, 
undermines the constitutional right of Congress to, to control the purse strings. I am, as, as I took office on March 12th and as I have jurisdiction over the FBI, I am not familiar with all details or of, of everything that went into the reports with respect to the initial uh, contact by ATF and what was done there, so I really can't address that. But I can, in the more general term, suggest something that has guided me both as a prosecutor in Miami and here, and that is a very clear concern for the Posse Comitatus Act and for strict adherence to it. And that is something that I constantly ask about and am concerned about for the reasons you suggest. Has your office looked into the, the issue of the, of the misuse of, of this authority by uh, ATF? From all that I have been able to understand, and again, I do not know the details of the ATF study, but from, from what I understand from the experts that I have, whose views I've considered, I think they, they think it was a thorough study. So I have not reviewed it in detail. Do you know anyone in the department who might have reviewed it? I'll be happy to check and see if there is a person, and after the lunch break, if I may, I'll provide you with that information. Is it possible that you could order someone in, in your office to, uh, to look at that review of, of, uh, of that drug connection? If, if I may, let me see just exactly what's been done, and we will report to you just as soon as possible to make sure that you have the full information. Would, would the Department of Justice, based on what you have heard or, or uh, the, the, the Treasury uh, report, et cetera, uh, consider drafting guidelines uh, for the uh, identification of drug involvement to prevent the, the sort of abuse that, uh, of the system that, that we saw in this particular case? I will review it and see just what is in place to make sure that, but again, my jurisdiction and what I can provide guidelines for is in effect limited to the Department of Justice agencies and I feel very comfortable with our processes, uh, but it's something that we've got to constantly review to ensure that there are appropriate checks and balances and I will do so. Does, uh, does, do you know if Congress needs to, uh, to tighten up uh, the definition of, of drug involvement for the purposes of uh, acquiring a military assistance? I think that from all that I have seen, the law is as satisfactory as it is now. But what I will do is again review it to make sure and try to provide you with whatever information uh, we develop. Mr. Russell, your time is expired. Thank you, Madam Attorney General. Mr. Conyers, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General, um, there is a, a, a great deal of uh, evidence that this committee has already received indicating that the decision uh, was the Attorney General's and the Attorney General's alone. And some members cannot accept that you had that much responsibility, especially early on. This, this was an ongoing event when you came to the Attorney General's office. And uh, I don't know, uh, it suggests that perhaps that because you are a woman that they didn't think that you would be shouldering all this by yourself. Have, have you had any experience with this kind of uh, attitude before? The last time I had experience with that was when I was appointed state attorney of Dade County in 1978. And people would stop me on the street and say they were sorry, but I seemed like a nice girl, but they didn't think I could do the job. After I'd been in office for five months, one of my chief critics in that regard came to see me and said he'd changed his mind. <laughs> I will tell you that from Chairman Hyde, Chairman McCollum, I don't know Chairman Zeloff as well, and for the members of this committee, they have been nothing but supportive in terms of my capacity to do the job. They may disagree with me on a number of occasions, and we will continue to disagree, but they have been very supportive of, of my ability to do the job, even if I am a lady. Well, I, I think that... Uh I think you've held yourself in good stead because you immediately made it clear that if there was any responsibility or culpability to be assigned anyone, that you would offer your resignation, 
which was refused by the President of the United States. And I, for one, uh, thinking this matter out, I think that you made the right decision, and I'm glad you're still on the job, because there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think that, that the time that you are here at this particular point in American history gives you a unique opportunity to move on correcting things that, uh, that still need correcting. And we've been talking about them uh, across already the, the short period that you've been Attorney General. Now, what about losing the element of surprise as a tactical error? Can you comment on, on that? And by the way, that wasn't discovered by these two committees. Uh, that's been known for quite some time. But how, how did losing the uh, element of surprise affect the uh, strategy that was employed at Waco, ma'am? Well, again, as in response to Congresswoman Ross Leighton, I have not delved into the intricacies of, of what led to the Treasury raid on, 19, on February 28, 1993. I inherited that and obviously had an impact, but I have been very impressed with Treasury's response, its candid, in-depth investigation uh, from, from what I hear, as I indicated to the Congresswoman, uh, people think it was a thorough investigation, and I think clearly re it clearly reflects that it had a, a very adverse effect. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I, I was impressed with uh, Chairman Hyde, my friend, uh, reading my comments uh, earlier about this matter, and I, I, sorry I don't have his comments, which were very instructive that I plan to bring up on the next round, and, and uh, they are of such magnitude I plan to put them in the record. But I yield back the balance of my time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Conyers. Speaking of Mr. Hyde, he is recognized for five minutes. I just wish the distinguished gentleman would put them on a chart. <laughs> well, the record is quite sufficient, sir. Well, I, I'm not sure you're serious about, about what you're saying. Uh, M Madam Attorney General, a reading from the report to the Deputy Attorney General on the events at Waco, Texas, February 28th, April 19th, a Department of Justice document dated October 8th, 1993, and turning to page 271. Uh, on April 16th, Richard met with Hubble and Carl Stern. According to Richard, Hubble advised him that the Attorney General had disapproved the plan to end the FBI standoff. Hubble then asked Richard what he thought the FBI's reaction might be. Richard answered that the FBI would not be pleased, that they would nonetheless accept the decision, and that they may then talk in terms of withdrawal. When Hubble asked Richard if he would like to speak to the Attorney General about the decision, Richard declined, explaining he had nothing more to say. According to Richard, Stern commented, that going ahead with the plan might be looked down on in the eyes of the public and likened it to Saddam Hussein's gassing of the Kurds. Richard disagreed with Stern's analogy. A short time after Hubble spoke to the FBI to report the decision, Director Sessions, Clark, and Potts arrived in his office. According to Richard, when Hubble advised them that the Attorney General had disapproved the plan, Director Sessions asked to speak with her, to her. Hubble left and returned 10 minutes later with the Attorney General, who made no reference to her disapproval of the plan. Instead, Reno, who was still not convinced about the timing, requested the preparation of a documented statement describing the situation inside the compound, the progress of the negotiations, and the merits of the proposal. She asked that the statement be completed by the following afternoon. Now, there is a footnote, number 35. The Attorney General did not read the prepared statement carefully, nor did she read the supporting documentation provided along with the statement. She read only a chronology, gave the rest of the materials a cursory review, 
and satisfied herself that, quote, the documentation was there. Now, something caused you to change your mind. Was it Director Sessions? Obviously, it wasn't this memorandum because you only, you, you didn't really read it. You looked at it cursorily. Um, I just have two questions. Who convinced you? Was it Hubble? Was it Sessions? That you should go ahead with this and give it approval? And why didn't you read the documentation of the briefing book that they gave you? I did not ask for it as a briefing book, Mr. Chairman. What I had asked in the course since I had first been confronted with the possibility that there might be a gas plan the week before, I had been gaining additional information. When the formal plan was submitted to me on August, April the 12th, you're aware of the questions that I asked. The first question I asked was about the gas, its impact on the elderly and the children. I continued to explore that. I listened to how people described how the representatives of the HRT team, how Dr. Salem described its impact, and that was of concern to me. I would not like to use it on a child if I didn't find another alternative because it would be uncomfortable, but it would be far better if I could bring those children out than exposing them to danger down the road from suicide plans that Koresh himself had rehearsed. So that was one of the considerations. I then looked, as I have explained before, because this was a gradual process. I had not decided on April the 12th or on April the 13th what to do or not to do. I just knew I wasn't going ahead at that point because I didn't have enough information. I've explored with you what I did in terms of identifying the food supply, of re-examining the water supply, of looking to see what had been done about negotiations. With the advent of the letter, which put a whole new twist to it, we started talking about the letter and what might be expected and what they had been able to get out in terms of any tangible evidence that he was indeed going to comply with the terms of the letter, unlike the terms of his March 2nd statement that he would come out when the tape had been played. When Hubble came in to see me, I had, at that point, was still concerned about where we stood with respect to all of the issues. When I went to see them, I walked with Hubble to his office where the representatives of the FBI were. I think it was Director Sessions, Floyd Clark, and Larry Potts. I don't know who else was there. We talked further. And one of the points that kept coming up was what the HRT team had told me, I mean the military HRT team, that 51 days on site you would begin to lose a state of readiness. You should be pulled back to be retrained. As we discussed it, what was clear to me was, again, they were not going to be able to control that perimeter and control the circumstances. You, you do agree that only one hostage rescue team is not enough. Did we learn that from this event, did we not? As I indicated to you and as you, when we looked back to our conversations a little over two years ago, what I was faced with, I said, why can't we pull the HRT team back and put in a SWAT team? I was told by both the military commanders and the FBI that the SWAT team as it existed at the time was not trained to properly protect and provide the security that was necessary and that they would be reluctant to do that. As you know, one of my first recommendations that I followed through on was to try to enhance the capacity of the SWAT teams that were already in existence to interlink with the HRT team and to expand the HRT team. Because if I had had the expanded capacity, the very question I asked was, can't we put somebody else in there? What about local law enforcement? I asked them about that. Couldn't we go to some of the really good local law enforcement agencies in the country and see if they had a capacity to substitute? And was told that that was not the case. So clearly, as I said in my opening statement, one of the recommendations that we have made, uh, because as you had pointed out, uh, the administration had, had asked for uh, uh, additional SWAT team, and, and it was immediately approved after this matter had been aired in, in April of 1993. But it was at that point in the discussion with Director Sessions, with the other people there, nobody, no one person changed my mind. It was, I was not prepared to move with the additional statements from the FBI that they were going to ultimately have to pull that HRT team back and that they were reaching the limit. 
this seemed to be the best time, not knowing if six days later... In, in other might... words, the, the fatigue, and I mean that not pejoratively, of the hostage rescue team drove you to say, we, it's now or never, so let's do it. They did not characterize it as fatigue. They characterized it as a need to retrain uh, in terms of the skills, and they characterized it as a diminution in terms of skills of, of judgment of being on the front line for 51 days. And it was that discussion and the recognition that if I waited 10 days, he might carry out what he had threatened to do on March the 2nd, and we would be far less prepared to deal with that than if we did it under our own terms. Mr. Hyde, your time has expired. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, looking at the board, I think there's some things that need to be clarified. I have before me a, state, uh, a document from the administration of William J. Clinton, 1993, and I'd like to quote some parts of it in uh, reference to one... I'm sorry? Okay, uh, date of um, April 19th, uh, 1993. The question is, Mr. President, did you authorize the move on Waco this morning, sir? His response, I was aware of it. I think the Attorney General made the decision, and I think we, I should refer all questions to her and the FBI. In response to a further question, I want to refer you to talk to the Attorney General and the FBI I knew it was going to be done, but the decisions were entirely there as all tactical. Mr. Chairman, I point this out because the time of this is 10.58 a.m. in the middle of the raid. So, of course, any tactical questions should not be responded to by the President at a press conference in Washington, but by the Attorney General and the FBI on the scene. Uh, later, the next day, uh, April 20th, uh, we have a quote uh, on page 461. I was informed of the plan to end the siege. I discussed it with Attorney General Reno. I asked questions I thought were appropriate for me to ask. I then told her to do what she thought was right, and I take full responsibility for the implementation of the decision. Uh, Attorney Gen General Reno, is that um, an accurate, as far as you can remember, what happened? The president was asked, in the middle of the siege and deferred questions to you, and that's what's kind of up there. But as soon as the siege was over, he took the responsibility that everyone on the administration has agreed that he did. I just, I think this is, is one of the most curious issues to come in here because I think the President of the United States did absolutely right. He was asked, he asked to be informed of, of a person whom he had not nominated as, as Attorney General to be kept informed. He knew that he would be informed if plans changed. We informed him. He did not intervene in law enforcement issues except to ask good questions and to make sure that we had explored every opportunity uh, to resolve the matter peacefully. He was concerned. He left the tactical decisions to us. And I just want the American people to understand how important it is. If the President of the United States is going to be involved in and taking operational responsibility for law enforcement actions, that's just con inconsistent with what we should be doing in this country to, k to provide for an appropriate balance where Congress and the executive conduct the policy decisions, the operation decisions, but law enforcement is done without regard to, to interference from the outside, and he just did the right thing. And it it been? has been puzzling to me because some people say the president didn't take enough responsibility, and then during the course of these hearings, other people have said he exercised too much responsibility. I think he did just right. And was any, would it have been appropriate for him to ask, answer tactical questions in the early stages of the siege itself? If I'd heard that he was doing that, I would have been on the phone telling him to please, please, please don't say anything while we had a very sensitive operation underway. Thank you, um, uh, Attorney General. Uh, on another subject, the reaction of uh, some of the Davidians and other incidences uh, that have occurred have led uh, some to believe that there are groups of Americans that have lost confidence in law enforcement. Senator Bradley last week mentioned the a uh, case of an African-American law student in Los Angeles who was stopped for no apparent reason, handcuffed, but subsequently released. 
you are aware of other indignities that many of our law-abiding citizens suffer uh, if they happen to fit a drug courier profile where innocent people who happen to fit a demographic profile are stopped to be searched. Law-abiding citizens and some gun who own legal firearms ought to feel that secure that law enforcement personnel will not stop them and search them or invade their homes. Uh, historically, the only defense that we've had against this has been law-abiding law, against the only defense that law-abiding citizens have against these illegal searches has been the exclusionary rule, which provides that the results of an illegal search cannot be used in a trial. Law enforcement officers, therefore, have no incentive to make illegal searches, no incentive to invade the homes of law-abiding citizens, because even if they found something, they couldn't use it at trial. During these hearings, we've heard from law enforcement officers who have said that they can enforce the law without breaking the law. We've heard the head of the ATF say that he is a strong supporter of the exclusionary rule. And we heard the former director of the FBI said that if there are any problems in complying with the ex rigors of the exclusionary rule, that the standards of law enforcement should be enhanced, not important standards of the law diminished to accommodate law, law enforcement personnel. He specifically criticized uh, excusing so-called good faith illegal searches. Uh, in spite of the strong support for the exclusionary rule, we've also received testimony that the watered down exclusionary rule has made it, um, has not been the strong protector for innocent people that it traditionally has. So my question, Attorney General Reno, in light of the strong support we've heard for the exclusionary rule, including high-ranking career law enforcement personnel, can we get the support of the administration for the strongest enforcement of the exclusionary rule so that law-abiding citizens can have appropriate confidence that they will not be stopped and searched or have their homes invaded when they have committed no crimes? As a prosecutor for a number of years, and now as Attorney General, I support the exclusionary rule wholeheartedly. I had the opportunity to serve on a committee of the American Bar Association that addressed the issue. And the exclusionary rule, in the eyes of law enforcement, has been a very helpful tool in terms of ensuring professionalism and appropriate regard for the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Your time has expired. Mr. Klinger, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Attorney General Reno, for being here today to uh, discuss these very serious issues. I just have a couple of comments and then a question. I think with returning to the question about the use of the tank, I can appreciate the, uh, the statement that uh, the tank was used as a defensive means of protecting uh, agents who were involved in that raid. But I think uh, you would agree that if you were on the inside of the compound looking out, you might not have had quite such a benign view of that tank, nor would you have been aware that the tank was was not armed. That in fact it was uh, it was it, it would look like a very very menacing, I think, uh, threatening piece of equipment coming at you. So I I think it really depends on your perspective as to uh, as to the tank. Obviously, one of the reasons for these hearings is because the credibility, uh, the effectiveness of uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement, has been called into question by a number of events. And I think obviously one of the purposes of these hearings is to try to. Uh, identify those areas that need to be changed, corrected, uh, reformed in order to restore credibility in federal law enforcement. I think that is the, a mission that we are all, uh, we all can share. Uh, I think uh, largely these criticisms have been leveled to the ATF, but there have been some to, to the FBI as well. And most recently the question of the credibility of the report that was done uh, with regard to the Ruby Ridge situation. And I just would ask you up front, uh, General uh, Reno, because there has been uh, serious questions raised about that report and about the activities of the people doing the investigation and is now being reinvestigated, do you anticipate that that report will be forthcoming soon, that is the re-evaluation of the events at Ruby Ridge? With respect to your first issue about the tanks and the, the menacing quality, uh, those tanks had been around, people knew about the tanks. Uh, I think they were very accustomed to the tanks uh, at that point. And in the early morning, as I think Mr. Sage has told the committees, uh, Byron Sage specifically announced that there was going to be an insertion of gas, that they would not be fired on, that they had an opportunity to come out, that they could come out peacefully, where they would go, how they would come out. 
They were given an opportunity to come out. They were not fired on. And I think that it's clear that in those situations where they have killed four law enforcement agents, where they have wounded 15, that to expose FBI agents to danger unnecessarily would just be wrong. I think it provided the proper balance. I agree. With respect to Ruby Ridge, we have conducted an extensive investigation that is still ongoing. The local prosecutor, since state statutes may, statutes may differ from federal statutes, has asked for the opportunity to pursue the matter without us commenting on it. And as soon as I am able to, consistent with his investigation and consistent with the ongoing investigation, I want to do everything I can that's proper under the federal privacy laws to make to the information available. You don't at this point have a, a, an end date in, in view as to when this might No, uh, sir, I don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, I may have a little different perspective on what, what we're doing here, but because I think one of the charges we have in the Government Reform and Oversight Committee is how we can, in fact, reform government, how we can downsize government, how we can make it more efficient and more effective. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the organization structure of the nation's law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, because that has been called into question. As I say, their credibility has been under attack. Uh, we've heard testimony that while the ATF was conducting what would, turned out to be the largest law enforcement raid in the nation's history, uh, their boss, who would be Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson, was in Europe at a G7 meeting, and I'm, I'm not in any way criticizing him for doing what his primary responsibility is, which is to, uh, as the Treasury Secretary, being at those meetings. But I think it does make me wonder why the federal government's police force, uh, which is very highly visible, is located at the Department of Treasury. I don't think that it's necessarily a priority item with the Secretary of Treasury. I don't think it should be. I mean, and therefore, I think the question arises, uh, you know, is that a proper place for uh, the nation's police department to, to be? Uh, I also remember early suggestions by the National Performance Review that some law enforcement agencies should be consolidated and that the recommendation was then rejected. Uh, my question is this, uh, have the events at Ruby Ridge and Waco and uh, the two years that have transpired since those events given you any thoughts about the reorganizing of the federal law enforcement agencies. It just seems to me that uh, particularly ATF perhaps has not received the close supervision in the Department of Treasury, uh, which has given rise to the charge that it's a rogue elephant of law enforcement. Wouldn't it be better to have that really under the purview of the, uh, of the department that is most intimately involved with law enforcement and with the uh, federal uh, judicial system? As, as you will recall, not only is, I mean, Treasury has two very fine law enforcement agencies, both Customs and ATF. One of the things that I resolved when I came to Washington was to try to avoid turf battles. I didn't come to Washington to take over other people's territories. I came to Washington to work together to make sure that we coordinated as thoroughly as we possibly could and that there were steps to be taken within the Department of Justice. We developed the Office of Investigative Agency Policy that has taken some giant strides with Director Free and Administrator Constantine's leadership in bringing the Justice Department agencies together in close coordination, and I'm very proud of that effort. But we've reached beyond that, and we have worked with the Treasury Department, having meetings uh, and working together on matters of mutual concern so that there is coordination, and that is the way that I have proceeded. Mr. Klinger, your time has expired. Mr. Lantos, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by saying, Madam Attorney General, that you exude a degree of sincerity and decency and competence and compassion that makes all of us very proud to have you as our Attorney General. You are a terrific role model for millions of young women who aspire to public service. I have taken it upon myself to try to give both the events and this set of hearings some degree of historical perspective. And over the course of uh, the last few days, it's become increasingly clear to me that the historical parallel to Baco is, of course, Jonestown, a charismatic, criminal, deranged cult leader causing the nightmarish death, in this case, through self-immolation of a large number of American citizens. But I also think it's important that we look at the hearings in historical perspective, because hearings are a very important part of this 
Congress, of any Congress, every time we hold a set of hearings, we ourselves are on trial. So what is the verdict with respect to the hearings? And it's a mixed verdict. I want to pay tribute to Chairman McCollum for the degree of objectivity and fairness with which he conducted his portion of the hearings. And I want to pay tribute to him for being man enough to state the obvious facts. I quote from, I believe, yesterday. It was Chairman McCollum who said he believes the hearings should close the book on speculation about how the fire was started. And I'm quoting him directly. It seems very apparent to me the fire was started inside that compound by the Vidians." End quote. This is a responsible, intelligent, and obviously factually accurate comment. But I must say that, in part, these hearings are eerily reminiscent of the McCarthy hearings of the 1950s that some of us are old enough to remember. Senator Joseph McCarthy usually would call a press conference prior to his hearings to inform the press in advance about what would be established in the hearings. And the press dutifully reported Senator McCarthy's claims. When the actual hearings were held, the witnesses did not say what Senator McCarthy said they would say or what he wanted them to say. But the press had already reported his charges. Now, it seems to me that in a number of instances, we have had very significant parallels to the McCarthy hearings. Contrary to Chairman McCollum's conclusion, I believe a day or two ago, our other chairman stated, and I quote, we killed over 80 people. Well, we presumably meaning the government. It is not the government that did it. It is Koresh that did it. And I think it's extremely important as Congress attempts to rebuild its reputation that all of us in this body act with a degree of responsibility. In this connection, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record a letter from the distinguished judge, the White House counsel, Mr. Mikva, to Mr. Zalik, which states in the opening paragraph, I am writing in response to your comments on Meet the Press regarding the President's involvement in events at Waco. Your comments were nothing short of irresponsible, intent on creating a story without any news, and alleging a scandal without any basis. Madam Attorney General, I would be grateful. Without, obje without objection, it will be. Yeah, I'll yield just for a I, second response. I would like to finish asking my question. I Ma I Madam Attorney General, I'm designed to embarrass uh, uh, Mr. Zeliff. Uh, I'm going to object to that Madam, in place in the record. Mr. Chairman, I think it's my time. Objection, objection has been heard. I'm sorry. Uh, Pina, may I finish my question? Finish your question. Thank you. Madam Attorney General, would you uh, draw your view of the historic parallel between Jonestown and Waco? Each situation is going to be different, Congressman. In one situation, it may be one group. In another, it may be somebody with particular ideas. We have got to learn from each experience, and one of the steps that the FBI has taken is to try to develop and in the process of, of composing its critical incident response group the capacity to learn from Jonestown, to learn from Waco, so that we build on our experience to do everything we can to avoid such a tragedy for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, your time has expired. Mr. Schiff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General, I'd like to ask you first that uh, you've now been here for some time this morning. Have you in any way felt treated unfairly at this hearing this morning? Have you felt that you're being the victim of any kind of McCarthyite tactics or anything like that? No, sir. Thank you very much. Madam Attorney General, I said earlier and want to reemphasize that in fairness to you and to the Department of Justice, by the time you got involved, the siege had already started, the, the raid had failed because the raid was launched by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is under the Treasury Department. And I bring it up again because Representative Ross Leitonen asked you several questions about misrepresenting to the military the fact that claim, the claim that this was a drug-related raid when it was never 
originally a drug-related raid. It was always a firearms violation raid. I want to say that was done by BATF also and not by anyone in the Justice Department. I think it's significant, though, because I think it shows that the BATF uh, so desperately wanted the military training that they misrepresented the facts of the raid to get the training at least without reimbursement because they wanted this to be a military assault kind of operation and safety factors for all considered uh, didn't matter to the agency, including safety to their own people. Madam Attorney General, having recognized that you got into a very difficult and inherently difficult situation, uh, as has been stated, I think there are some legitimate questions that we might ask you about this. One is, you stated that the, uh, your first concern was about the effects of CS gas if it were used. Um, I think that's an understandable concern. I asked all of the witnesses who testified as experts about CS gas, did they know any uh, precedent anywhere in the world where there was a plan to pump CS gas into a building for 48 hours straight, which was part of the FBI's plan, and they all answered no. And I asked the witnesses, did they know of any precedent anywhere in the world for the deliberate uh, insertion of CS gas into a building for any length of time in which uh, there were children or particularly infants present? And they said no. And I'm wondering if when you were being advised about CS gas, if you asked that question about uh, has this been done before as the FBI wishes to do it in this case? We explored it because I was trying to see whether there were other circumstances. I don't think that I learned of any other circumstances in which a, a similar situation was involved. And so I don't think that we were able to, to find any precedent for it. Wouldn't that kind of indicate that there could be a problem with that plan if you can't find any precedent for it? One of the points that we tried to address was did we have any record of it? Did we know anything? We went to everything that we could find. I consulted with Dr. Salem. He consulted with uh, or talked to a pediatrician, as I understand it, trying to see what we knew, coming to the point that considering everything, considering the fact that they had rehearsed a plan to come out with explosives on them, blow themselves and agents up and others commit suicide, how could we best control it under what circumstances? And taking everything into consideration, I made the best judgment I could based on the information that we had available. And with the understanding, of course, is because I've gone back and double-checked this, one of the things that I want to try to do is to make sure that if new information is developed, we pursue it to see how we can learn from what we have done to avoid a problem for the future. We brought in the British experts to make sure that we had outside judgments to, to see, to look, to explore. And they confirmed that the amount of gas, as I understand it, is coming into the compound during that six to seven hours was more than within safe limits. We will continue, as I said in my opening statement, to review all non-lethal capacity to end res situations like this in the most peaceful manner possible. I just want to say it, it's uh, more than interesting to me that we ask the British who use CS gas their view of this plan by the FBI, and they've never done this plan in their history of using CS gas. Uh, my time is almost uh, out. I'd like to ask, were you aware that the, the uh, FBI had kind of a contingency plan that if the, um, if, if the initial insertion of gas didn't work, they would try to, to uh, uh, rush the situation at one time? I, this raises the point that, that Chairman Hyde was m making because of what I, the question of what I was aware of. I had asked as we went through that week for them to prepare a statement reflecting what I had been briefed on so we would have a record of what I knew. It's been referred to as a briefing book. I used it and had it prepared as here's what we've done. I think it clearly reflects that if they were fired on, they were going to continue to try to insert the gas in a more overall way to make sure that we tried to resolve it. And again, from what I understand, because the question has been raised, both from Dr. Salem and from the British experts, we did everything we could to make sure that the amount of gas involved over that six to seven hour period that morning, can't remember the exact time, was well, well, well within safe limits. 
That is, is what is so important in terms of trying to understand. You say the British had never been confronted with something like this before. Very few people, I suspect, ever have ever been confronted with something exactly like we were confronted with. Thank you, Mr. Time Schiff. Your time has expired. Mr. Watt, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Attorney General, um, I would like to uh, use my time as I have throughout this hearing uh, or series of uh, days in this hearing to try to emphasize the things that we as a nation and uh, as a government learned from this experience um, not in an effort to second guess what has happened but to inform us uh, in a way that uh, if we ever are confronted with this kind of situation again, we can handle it better. Uh, we can be more compassionate. The public can um, can have more confidence um, that the government is operating efficiently and compassionately and with um, the best uh, integrity it can. And in that respect, I want to um, extend my sincere compliments to you for spending two entire, almost two entire pages in your presentation uh, dealing with things that uh, you have implemented um, in response to the lessons learned and uh, at the Waco incident. And I want to get to asking you a couple of questions about those incidents uh, about those recommendations, but there are two things factually in the rest of your statement that um, I don't believe I was aware of that I'd like to ask you about um, uh, and ask you to uh, give, give me a little more information. On page one in the second paragraph of your presentation, you talk about the fact that the FBI showed Koresh's April 14 letter to an expert at Syracuse University who concluded it was another ploy, another delaying tactic. And I'm wondering, first of all, uh, what process that person went through, who that person was, uh, and how they could make that determination uh, just from looking at his letter. Uh, second, on page three of your presentation, you uh, this sentence appears, the perimeter was becoming increasingly unstable with frequent reports of outsiders, including at least one militia group on the way either to help Koresh or attack him. And I'm wondering if you could uh, give us a little more information about uh, uh, that militia group uh, that uh, might have uh, uh, been inserting itself into this, uh, what information do we have about that? Thank you, sir. With respect to Dr. Sadly, Dr. Murray Myron passed away just very recently, but my understanding is, and I was advised at the time, that he had been continuously employed as a contract consultant to the FBI on retainer for the past 18 years. He had extensive experience in negotiations and had assisted in negotiator training. Uh, he had assisted the FBI in the Atlanta homicides and the Resso kidnapping. He was uh, apparently one of the country's experts in how do you try to resolve these issues, and the FBI had relied on him a great deal. He presented uh, a report um, right at the time discussing in detail, and we'll be happy to make sure that everybody has a copy of the report. I think yeah, that I'd the I'd like to take a look at that. Can you move on to the second issue? And Because I want to ask a question about what you're doing prospectively looking forward. Okay. With respect to the, the second issue, we, there had been two intruders into the compound. We had received information concerning a militia that might be coming to assist Koresh and there were general concerns about the perimeter, remembering that one of those weapons could fire a distance of from here to the White House as it was, I asked them, what is the distance that big weapon could fire? And 
from here to the White House, and so they were very concerned about the perimeter. Was there specific information about a particular militia group that uh, that uh, you are able to make available to us? Or yes, and, and the name of it, I wanted to make sure I had the exact name. It was the Unorganized Militia of the United States. The call had gone out nationwide from an attorney for armed people to come to Waco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll pursue the, the other line in the thank second you, thank round. Thank you, Mr. White. Your time has expired. Mr. Ehrlich, you're recognized for five minutes. Madam Attorney General, uh, we appreciate you being here today. I have a couple of very specific questions. Uh, and I, you understand time is short. I'm going to ask them uh, pretty quickly here. With respect to the element of child abuse, I'm firmly convinced uh, that uh, gross abuses of children occurred within that compound uh, prior to the first raid. My question to you, though, is specifically after the initial uh, attack during the siege, were you relying on any uh, firm pieces of evidence regarding uh, continuation of child abuse by Koresh against those kids? And, and, and did that, and if the answer is yes, did that play, was that an element in your ultimate decision to proceed with the raid, the second raid? The factor of child abuse was because we had clear information that there had been allegations of child abuse that had occurred before the raid. And I specific, I heard and understood during the course of the briefing that he was beating the children at the time. I asked, is he beating the children? What, in going back over it with the FBI, what they had understood was that we had evidence of those that had come out that there had been beatings and they expected that they were continuing. What prompted me, for example, Dr. Perry testifying before you said that two of the children had come out after the raid had physical lesions on them from the beatings that they had received. And so it was this continuing feature and the fact that he had sexually abused the, the children as according to the best information we could gather that there was evidence of this physical beating that was clearly one of the factors I considered. Okay. All right, that's the answer to my question. Also, did the element of sexual child abuse enter into it as well? Yes. Uh, secondly, uh, expanding upon uh, your, the, the new information actually for me with respect to these unorganized militias and the call that, that went out, I guess I have two real short questions. One, it seems to me it should have been relatively easy to secure a perimeter around the compound given the amount of agents and personnel there. Uh, I'd like you to comment on that. Secondly, with respect to this particular plea that went out to the unorganized militias of the United States, did you have any evidence at the time that that plea had actually been acted upon? I did not have any evidence that that plea per se had been acted upon. We had had people who had come into the compound and I can provide whatever information that was available and, and we will have that available for you. With respect to the security of the perimeter, this troubled me. I had the same reaction with the number of FBI agents on the scene, with the Texas Rangers, with local law enforcement. Why can't we ensure the, the, the security of the perimeter? It was explained that the HRT team was highly trained. It, they were sharpshooters. They explained to me the weaponry that they expected that Koresh had the distance it could shoot. And I said, but if we have to pull the one HRT team back, can't we put in a, a SWAT team? It was interesting to me that both the commanders of the military HRT team and the FBI said that they could not ensure a perimeter with the, the same security if they used a SWAT team. And that was, frankly, a surprise to me as I have now had the opportunity to see in my visits to the Critical Incident Response Group at, at Quantico, the SWAT teams have been, their training has been enhanced so that they could link now with the HRT team, but I went through exactly the same process as you in trying to understand it. Finally, I have a lot more questions and this is a very uh, tough way to proceed, as you know, but my last question really is, God knows you've been introduced to politics during your time in Washington. Uh, You've heard various accusations back and forth uh, concerning the purpose of these oversight hearings. And my question to you would be, do you think, in your personal opinion, that these 10 days of hearings have served an appropriate and responsible purpose 
Oh, on behalf of the American people. I haven't been able to, to follow the hearings in, in great detail, but as I told Chairman McCollum when he and I talked early on, I would always welcome the opportunity to answer any question that I can about this. I have said from the beginning that I'm accountable, and I welcome this opportunity to exchange this information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Early. Mr. Wise, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just before Attorney General Reno, I'd say I regret that uh, Mr. Barr saw fit to object to Mr. Uh, Lantos introducing a letter from the White House. Uh, I regret that simply for the reason that there have been allegations made about the White House involvement or lack of involvement. Uh, there were statements made on a national television show by Chairman Zeliff uh, uh, this Sunday. They were again raised, although in a milder form, in his opening statements. And I would think that the White House response to what has been put in the record by the other side would be something that everyone would think ought to be in there uh, simply for fair play. But since apparently it's not going to be, uh, we'll have to get that letter out uh, in other ways. Uh, and I, also, I just think it also reflects badly because I think this committee has been fairly open on both sides about permitting things to be in the record, uh, particularly doc uh, documents coming from uh, officials. Uh, now, Madam Attorney General, I would like to, if I could, hop around quickly to some points that were covered and, and maybe see if some uh, I's could be dotted and T's crossed. The question was raised about the role of uh, Assistant Secretary Altman, who is a Treasury Department official, and whether or not he had been involved in a briefing prior to uh, the FBI's um, uh, insertion of gas at Waco. And you had testified that you did not believe that he was involved in a briefing that the Justice Department performed. Uh, my question is whether you're, you know of whether or not Mr. Altman or Mr. Noble, another Treasury Department official, were involved in any way in the briefings that were taking place that they, by which they were preparing you uh, in the days leading up to April the 19th. They were not involved in my briefings. Uh, again, I was just referring to the document. I did, it, it, it indicated that he had walked away from a briefing. But I think it is important to put into context just what was done there. When I first considered it, I had the same concerns and continued to have the same concerns. I stayed awake at night trying to figure out what was the right thing to do. What about the children? And I weighed all the factors that I'm sure that Mr. Altman didn't have, and I th think it's perfectly natural for him to have been concerned. I was concerned. I think we were all concerned about what Koresh might do. That gets to my second question, which was the knowledge that you acquired that perhaps he did not have. Do you have uh, any knowledge of whether or not he was present for any briefings, for instance, by Dr. Salem, who was the military expert on CS gas that did who did advise you? I have no knowledge that Mr. Altman was briefed by Dr. Salem, but I don't know that one way or the other. But, but at least Mr. Altman uh, was not present in any briefing you were in by that, Dr. Salem. That is correct. Um, there's been a lot of concern, understandable, expressed about the role of CS gas, uh, particularly with children and elderly, and you've addressed that uh, extensively. I might point out that at the table where you, where you are sitting now, when we had the panel on CS gas, and there were a number of, of uh, witnesses, there were only two uh, at that time who were de certified experts in CS gas, uh, the two gentlemen from England. The others were there, uh, but had not that as a particular area of expertise. One was a chemist, one was a toxicologist with EPA, not officially there, I might add but no one had had that experience. The only two certified experts, and then Dr. Salem himself the next day, testified that they thought that the, it was um, uh, appropriate uh, and that it was not injected in any kind of lethal amounts. Uh, I'm just curious as to the follow-up that you did afterwards and the review that you did afterwards. Did you see anything to cause you to question that? What we did afterwards, as, as you know, is ask for a number of experts, including Dr. Stone from Harvard, to look at what had been done. We asked Dr. Stone to be involved, to, to look at our negotiations and how to resolve conflicts, but he, being an MD, also commented on gas. I mean, this was our expert bringing it forward. I asked that that be pursued to see, uh, since he was not a toxicologist, but he was an MD, whether how the FBI should consider the use of gas in the future. We have talked to all the experts 
that we can identify as really having solid substantive knowledge about the effects of gas and I am going to continue to do so as I mentioned earlier the our our effort is to try to identify through technology every non-lethal non-harmful means we can use to resolve conflicts like this in the future and we will continue to do that your, your time you, madam attorney General, has expired mr. wise mr. Coble you're recognized for five minutes Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I think it's unfortunate indeed that this hearing has been compared with the McCarthy hearings. I think that comparison is not well founded at all. Madam Attorney General, good to have you with us. Throughout history, a common thread has revealed man's reluctance to admit mistakes. I detect the presence of this thread in the Waco scenario. The Treasury and Justice Department submitted their respective reports in the wake of Waco. Treasury almost dutifully accepted the blame on behalf of ATF. Justice conversely exonerated the FBI, so we have one federal agency admitting mistakes, a second federal agency riding off into the sunset with the hero's cloak about its shoulders. When you first appeared before the House Judiciary Committee, Madam Attorney General, I said to you at that time that it appeared to me that everyone who touched the ball fumbled it, the Justice Department report notwithstanding. Offensive activities and conduct apparently were conducted within the confines of Mount Carmel while a flawed execution of the raid occurred beyond its confines. That's the way I see it. How do you see it? And what would you say to us, Madam Attorney General, in the way of suggestions to preclude a duplication of Waco? And, and Madam Attorney General, before you answer that, let me say this. It was a close call. We are applying 2020 hindsight today, a luxury not available to you at the time. So let me hear from you. Well, I sure didn't ride off with a cloak around me because I sure have got beat up along the way. Well, I don't, I don't did suggest that you, that the cloak was around your shoulders. Well, I don't know who had it, but the FBI and I have held ourselves accountable. We have been to ask available to answer questions and we're going to continue to be because as I told you and other members of the committee back in April of 1993 I struggled over this decision I don't know don't know and I respectfully suggest you don't know and I don't think any member of this committee will know what the right answer was if we had waited 15 days he might still have been working on the seal and he might have gotten fed up and executed the plan that he rehearsed March 2nd by putting on explosives coming out blowing up FBI agents and committing suicide himself and then you'd have me right here sitting here asking me why I hadn't moved earlier what we tried to do I looked at the conduct of FBI agents I found men who spent hours and hours and hours men and women trying to figure out how this matter could peacefully be resolved I found people making their best judgment, doing the right thing against a situation where you and I still don't know what the right answer is. So the suggestion that they be disciplined for trying to do the best they could with the information they had about a man like David Koresh, I think is, is wrong. Well, but I'm, what I'm the not suggesting that. Okay, but what, what we try to do, and I don't know whether you were here for my opening statement, was, was to look at what we could do for the future. One of the questions raised by our experts was, was there a sufficient cohesion between the negotiators and the people, the tactical people on the scene? We have now created a crisis incident response group where negotiators are trained with the people in operations so that there is a partnership, a team. One of the concerns, as I expressed to Chairman Hyde, was the fact that there was not another HRT team that I could put in place if I had the second team or if I had the circumstances with the SWAT teams training enhanced I could have moved them in and I would have waited that was one of the features the whole 
question that we, we have tried to do everything we could to try to gather experience based on Jonestown, based on other similar experiences so that we will have a database. We're trying to do everything we know how to be as prepared as we can for the future. I uh, thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, I missed the Attorney General's opening statement because I had to attend another hearing and uh, good to have you here. By the way. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kobo. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I'd like to reserve my time. Um, Ms. Lofgren, would you uh, like to be recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Attorney General Reno, I am uh, very glad that you're here today, and I'd just like to say that although I'm new to the Congress, I've been watching you, and I'm proud that you're our Attorney General. You're tough, smart, and most important, you have a lot of integrity and honesty and are, serve our country well as a consequence. Now, one question I had earlier in the hearings, I wonder if you have the figure, what was the siege costing a day? Do you have a figure on that, or if not? We can provide you, you with the figure, but Congresswoman, one of the things that I thought about, because... I'm not suggesting that okay, it people, was a factor, I just people, wanted to know. And I, I almost purposely didn't look at it, because people would stop me on the street and say, you're just spending money. Well, and I made a promise to myself, that I wouldn't put the money issue up as a factor when I had the lives of the children no, and the innocent that, people. I understand that, but I am interested in if well, you could get that I don't later, have I would it, be appreciated. It, when we come back after lunch, I'll have that figure Thank for you. you very much. You know, I've been thinking a lot, we, this is now our 10th day, and I've been thinking in some ways uh, of an analogy where you have uh, a man holding an infant standing on a bridge and the police officer comes up and tries to talk the man out of, into letting the child go, and after an hour lunges to grab the child, and the man jumps off into the, into the bay, killing himself and the child. Is the police officer responsible for the death of the child? And in some ways, I think of the Waco situation in that matter. Do you think that's an unfair analogy? I think all people in law enforcement, because most of my experience was in local law enforcement, police officers have to make some of the hardest decisions in the world. They've got one of the most difficult jobs there is. How do you enforce the law, protect human life, protect the people that you're trying to apprehend? It is so difficult. What is the right move? What is the wrong move? When do you shoot? When do you not shoot? There are some police officers who clearly exceed those bounds and they should be held accountable, and I have held them accountable. I have had to prosecute a police officer in a, in a situation of a shooting. But the mo it, one of the great experiences for me has been to travel across this country and talk to sheriffs, deputies from small counties, from urban police officers, from FBI agents, ATF agents who care so much about their country, so much about doing what's right. And sometimes they just don't know what the right answer is because they're dealing with the person that neither you nor I can fully comprehend. You know, earlier a couple of the more senior members mentioned Jonestown and it uh, uh, reminded me uh, many, many years ago I was uh, worked on the staff of Congressman Don Edwards and I remember very well uh, the time of Jonestown and uh, Congressman Edwards considered going down to Guyana the State Department did not want a Congress, any of the Congress members to go. Congressman Ryan felt that he should go, and in the end, uh, much to our relief, Congressman Edwards decided not to go. Uh, of course, Congressman Ryan lost his life. My uh, contemporary, Jackie Spear, was a lawyer on uh, uh, Leo's staff, was uh, terribly injured and, and uh, has suffers to some extent to this day. Uh, our constituent son died uh, in the mass suicide in Guyana. And as I thought about that and the, and the move uh, situation in Philadelphia and also uh, the situation here in Waco, one theme that does sort of jump out at me is the presence of systematic abuse of children. And I'm thinking ahead, if, if there's something that we can do that's very useful out of this hearing, and you've done many things in your department to to learn all the lessons that are possible. But how could we uh, become alert as a nation to the um, creation or growth of violent cults 
so as to have an early intervention system. And I realize that we must be very careful because we believe in freedom of religion, even if a religious belief is out of the mainstream, people have a r right to their beliefs. I feel that very strongly, and yet violence and cults are different. And it does seem to me that a trend, or at least one common theme, is child abuse. In this case, in the case of Waco, both physical and sexual. In the case of Jonestown, probably both physical and sexual. In the case of Moo, probably primarily physical. Have you given any thought to how we might organize nationally to become alert to those types of situations as they develop so that early interventions could be uh, made appropriately and, and the kind of situation where you found yourself where really there was no answer that, that was readily apparent. I, th I think it is very important to recognize one of the, the critical points that you make that we can't generalize that before we take action we've got to make sure that there is a basis for action and just because somebody has a, a different religion or a different group interest that that's not a subject for the federal government or for law enforcement to be involved in. But I think the investigation of child abuse is one of the most difficult investigative efforts there is. Uh, and it's something that we need to continue to develop expertise in. How are children interviewed? How can we arrange settings where they do not feel threatened? It is a very difficult issue, but I think it is imperative that we pursue that and our Office of Justice Programs is working with others around the country to make sure that we do everything we can from a federal perspective, recognizing that many of these issues are matters of local law enforcement, to support and assist those efforts. Lofgren, your time has expired. Mr. Booyer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, um, Madam Attorney General. First of all, let me let me personally uh, say to you uh, a deep, profound respect I have for uh, in a town where no one wants to claim responsibility that you step forward immediately, and, and I think that says uh, a lot about your character. Uh, I can't, uh, I've been a military officer now for 15 years, I've been a prosecutor, I've been a defense lawyer, I cannot disconnect myself from those life experiences. Not long ago when I was up at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, went to the Army War College, they gave me a staff ride out at Gettysburg. And I'll never forget the sense of standing there where uh, Lee sent Pickett out. A and uh, when Pickett came back, some reference about uh, where, where your forces, and he says, sir, I have no division, Robert E. Lee immediately uh, said it was my fault. And I've never been able to get out of my mind the vision of the President of the United States getting in a limousine uh, where he says, uh, you know, what's your immediate response to Waco? Well, call Janet Reno. It was her decision as he gets in the Waco and drives off. It's very difficult for me to flush that out of my mind, but I've been remained very objective. You see, I understand, Ms. Reno, that whenever there is an assignment, the assignment to lead a mission consecrates every effort to the fulfillment uh, driven by a profound conviction of duty. And the dignity of the situation is controlled by an instinct, uh, an instinct of proportionality. And that instinct, though, is also is common sense. And the proportionality question I, I'm going to ask you is because I know that your Justice Department had actually sought the uh, prosecution of civil rights uh, for those involved with Rodney King. And so my question to you, did, did you give proper attention to uh, the question of civil rights of those who were inside the compound? And, I, and, I, and I'm just curious, in your briefing book, was that covered? And I appreciate your uh, response to that. And then I've got an immediate question about the HRT team. Thank you. First of all, I often wonder what would have happened if Stonewall Jackson had still been alive at Gettysburg. I think you're right on that one. Well, I, um, we can talk about that another time. <laughs> One of the things that I've learned in Washington is don't ever make a, a comment to a television reporter as they stick a television camera and a microphone in your face and say, bah, 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 bah. just tell them that there are times and places where it's more appropriate. I just think the President of the United States has done a splendid job in assuming responsibility by recognizing what his Attorney General has done while at the same time making sure that there was not White House interference with a law enforcement decision. 
With respect to proportionality, I spent hours trying to figure out how I could hold David Koresh and the people who killed those four ATF agents and injured 15 accountable, while at the same time protecting the interest, the lives, the civil rights of innocent children and those that may have been held against their will. But based on what I had seen, what I needed to focus on most was the children, because it appeared that all others who were in any way that there against their will had, had come out. The reason I asked that question, because it was, it's very bothersome to me when I hear uh, the President say that there, there's no moral equivalency, and that's bothersome to me because the ends does not justify the means in a lawful society. So in your briefing book, that was my specific question, your briefing book, did you receive anything from your Civil Rights Division? Yes or no? You keep referring to the briefing book, and as I was going to tell Chairman Hyde, this was a book that I had prepared so that it could reflect okay. historically In any on of the material, did. did they provide you any input? What we do when we consider prosecutions, whether it be the criminal division, the... Uh, Ma'am, it's, it's an easy one. Is it yes or no, did they provide you information? I was provided with information about people's civil rights and what you do to okay. properly apprehend them. Thank you. Them. The, the other question I with, have... With but I want to make sure that I'm accurate now, and I'll be happy to wait till you have the second question and then go back in my time to make sure that you understand just what's involved, if that's okay. That'd be fine. Okay. What's your next question? Well, now that, my, now that you use my time, I'll come back, ma'am. Go ahead, Mr. Bowie, if you'd like. All right, you were in the process thank you. of doing it. I appreciate that, ma'am. The other question I have was, was yesterday, I didn't mean to, uh, I, Ambassador Holmes and I uh, quibbled a bit, uh, Ambassador Holmes was saying, well, it wasn't really the military was saying that the FBI should pull their HR team off the line. He was saying, well, if it were the military's uh, HRT team, we would pull it offline. I, I want to note, though, that I went and I, I, I examined the memorandum for the record of the actual military who advised you, uh, who said, quote, my, my final comments to Attorney General were that, quote, I believe that the HRT should consider pulling their people off the target for a period to retrain and, and polish their perishable skills. Now, when the military is advising you to do that, a moment ago you said that the military said that SWAT teams could not secure the perimeter. Would you please explain to me why the military would advise you to pull, pull them off the perimeter because of the perishable skills and assets, yet at the same time saying, I guess the SWAT team could not secure the perimeter. Are you feeling the pressures that you had to then make that decision? Would you clarify this for me, please? I'm a little bit confused, but I think I can clarify it. The HRT team, the hostage rescue team, is different, was different at the time than SWAT teams. There was only one hostage rescue team that had the training, the skills, the sharp sh shooting capacity, and this is what I was advised. There was no other hostage rescue team that could be put in place while the HRT team was pulled off and retrained and brought up to a state of readiness. I specifically asked, well, why not use the SWAT team, which is separate, which is not as well trained as the HRT team? If you don't have SWAT teams, what about going to local law enforcement to, to find one of the best in the country? I was advised by both the FBI and the, HR, the, 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 the military that the SWAT teams would not, as they were currently then trained, have the capacity to properly substitute for the HRT team. So as far as I'm concerned, that was absolutely, I mean, that really came together. With respect to the civil rights issue, what we try to do when we make apprehensions, here I had a situation, and the situation that I was faced with, what do I do to affect the arrest of four of, of the people who were responsible for the killing of the ATF agents and the wounding of those agents. What I did was not only be concerned about their civil rights, but their lives, and try to do everything I could to bring that out peacefully. I didn't go in with a direct assault. I didn't go in with guns a-blazing. I went in in the best way I could based on the information I had that would provide opportunities for people to come out, come out, without being threatened, come out and be taken into custody in an appropriate way, consistent not just with civil rights, but consistent with the criminal law of this nation and consistent, most of all, with their opportunity to live. 
Thank you, Mr. Boyer. Uh, uh, now I recognize uh, Mrs. Slaughter for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's nice to see you, and you're absolutely right. You have certainly been beaten up. Uh, it's almost astonishing you think that all the United States and probably a good part of the world watched what happened in Waco and how proud everybody was that the Attorney General stood up and said the buck stops here, and I take the responsibility. Now, we've gone from that to suddenly you couldn't possibly have been responsible for it for various and sundry nefarious reasons, I think. Probably my colleague, Ms. Collins, at least alluded to one. Um, but there are numbers of things that, uh, that have come out here that I think have been terribly important that I've learned. One is that before the new administration came into being, uh, the ATF pretty much operated on its own, at least the testimony we have, is that no Secretary of Treasury before had ever been involved in what the ATF was doing. Uh, the second is that you've taken incredibly important steps to make sure that the things that happened in Waco didn't happen again. Uh, we, there were mistakes made there. One that's most apparent to me is I think that the people died at the day of the, trying to uh, serve the summons because too many people in town knew about it and they were tipped off by a mailman who was tipped off by a man from television who was told by a woman who worked in town. And I mean, that shows to me at least security procedures were very lax. But um, beyond that, I think we need to look, we've all talked about Koresh and the kind of man he's, but we've not done anything about looking at his followers. And I've gotten more fascinated with that as we've gone on and since we've heard from at least one member of the Branch Davidians. These were people that had given to this man everything of value, their families, their worldly goods, but most important, their ability to think for themselves. And it seems to me, as you get into that, that the likelihood that they would ever have come out of there, having made that much of an investment in him as the Messiah and the Lamb of God, and I understand that many of them still think, still believe very strongly and think he's coming any day now to bring back those people with him, they would never have come out without his permission. And so I really applaud what you were saying, that what you had to do was concentrate just on him uh, and whether or not he was going to come out. But just most, I want to talk to you about this before my time runs out here. There's been a lot of talk about jurisdiction and, and yours and, and I, uh, how far it went, but there's one question on jurisdiction that I'd like to know as it pertains to these hearings. It has been more than distressing to me as a member of Congress to learn of the outside interference in these committee hearings. We had an instance where a group went down to Texas wanting to investigate the guns paid for by an outside group, which they didn't want to admit to. We had one witness of Ms. Sparks who has tape of a woman who claims that she was on the team helping to prepare witnesses. We had a Dr. Scott from Harvard who said he was notified by a person who identified herself as a member of this committee. We had a story in the paper of a man who writes letters under the assumed name of Mr. Fiddleman who said he was part of the team getting ready for the Waco hearings. Um, it's, apparently these people at least had a witness list, which is more than we had. I had no idea until we got here on a day-to-day -day basis almost on who we were going to hear. I think this sets a terrible precedent. I'm not aware of any time in the past since I've been here that anything like that even came close to happening. And I don't know if this is in your jurisdiction. I'm not an attorney. I don't know anything about tampering with witnesses or anything on the outside of that. But if we allow, and frankly, I don't want it no matter what their philosophy is, whatever their belief is, or wherever they may be coming from, it seems to me that the Constitution and the rules under this House are very clear on how we conduct hearings. And frankly, I think one of the most serious breaches here is that we have really given the public questions as to really how accurate these, these things are. We have not, as you know, had an opportunity on our side to call a lot of the witnesses we'd like to hear from. And if you have jurisdiction over this, I, I would like to know how does one, uh, if you plan to look into it, what kind of request you need, uh, and certainly I'd like to have your opinion on that because I think in the history of, of this country and in this Congress that this is a very serious breach that I don't ever want to see happen again in any hearing at any time. I have such a respect for Congress, whether it's under Republican control or Democratic control. And I know with the chairman involved that appropriate actions will be taken if they are appropriate under the rules of, of this great institution. I think 
when something like this happens, it may well be beyond Congress's knowledge. But I think it is so important because I've watched this process and some people say, well, it's congressional hearings. They can perform such a wonderful function. And so I think it's important that we do everything we can to make sure that they are performed by the people who are elected. And in that connection, Mr. Chairman, I, I would say again to you what I have said. It has been a real pleasure to work with your staff and Chairman Zeliff's staff to try to be as responsive as we can and to try to do it the right way, and we appreciate that opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Madam Attorney General. My question. Is that your jurisdiction or I not? I am deferring to the institution of the House. I, I really think that that's the best place for it to be addressed, but I'd like to go on and really point out something else that is important. The last people to come out came out, the, the gas was inserted April the 19th. The last people to come out came out March 21st. And at that point, based on all the interviews of the people coming out, they were either people who were troublemakers for Koresh or were not his children or his adopted children. And I think it's clear that those people that remained there were not going to come out voluntarily under the, those circumstances. Mrs. Slaughter, your time has expired. Mr. Micah, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Reno, Earlier, you testified that you do everything possible to separate the White House from law enforcement function. Is that correct? Uh, One of the first points that was raised well, to me... You, you did uh, st basically s uh, state that. Is that correct? That you try to keep the White House separate from uh, law enforcement decisions? That is correct, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hyde pointed out this morning on page 271 that there was meeting at the White House and likened it to Saddam, this change in decision of how to approach this, likened it to Saddam Hussein's gassing of the Kurds. If you go through again in your document, the Department of Justice document, uh, we see uh, meetings and Mr. Hubble sat at that table, your deputy, and said he attended a meeting at the White House and they th think it was the 13th or the 14th for the purpose of discussing Waco and advising the White House of the FBI's plan to change tactics through the use of tear gas. Participating in the meeting were Newsbaum, Hubble, Lindsay, and the late uh, White House Deputy Counsel uh, Vince Foster. Hubble said he didn't talk to the President. Uh, are you aware if Mr. Foster s spoke to the President about this or if uh, he ke uh, kept a file on this matter? First of all, I think it's very important, Congressman, when you refer to matters not to mix things up. You made a reference to the you, fact. Well, were you aware that, that this meeting took place and Mr. Foster was there, and uh, were you aware of a file that he had kept on Waco, Vince Foster? I was not aware of, of who was at the meeting. I was aware that Webb Hubble was advising the White Thank you. May I finish, please, sir? Well, I think it's so I just wondered if you okay. were aware of the meeting. And well, I, if I may, then when you're sufficient. concluded your question, are you, if I could... Are you... This is your... Uh, the, the copy, a Xerox copy of the briefing book you received. Uh, I can't see it from here, uh, Well, sir. again, it's a briefing book that we did not receive. Were you aware that we did not receive a copy of this briefing book until I Friday, see, last Friday? I can't Friday. see which book it Within is. Within that, uh, we received sir, this on Friday. if you could just show Friday. me the book so I could follow Within it, Within the it would briefing really book, page 40, it said... Experience, experience with the effects of CS gas on uh, children, including infants, uh, has been extensively investigated. And this is contrary to what Dr. Salem uh, told us, and we believe uh, he told you. Uh, this morning you testified, ma'am. Uh, you said you thought no one else was coming out voluntarily where you were. Yet you, you proceeded with a plan uh, your plan was to continue pumping CS gas into Mount Carmel, uh, and uh, you, I, I, the question I have is, were you aware, again, with infants and children, almost two dozen of them, that uh, one of the major errors in this is that they didn't have uh, the ability to protect themselves from this gas? Uh, were you aware that the gas mask that they had uh, actually couldn't fit on women and children. This is a copy of the gas mask, uh, similar to what was used. Were you aware, uh, and Dr. Marcus testified, who sat also there, 
that one of the major flaws in, in your strategy was the fact that children and infants could not use gas. And also in the report uh, of the events that took place, it's the DOJ report which you ordered said its impact on infants and children cannot be ignored because gas masks are not available for <laughs> infants and younger children. Do you believe that that's a, 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 something, a flaw that was made, a, a, a missed decision? Yes. Let me begin first with your reference because it is so very important as we consider something. Congressman, this has been, as I mentioned earlier, and you may not have been here, the single hardest decision of my life. Well, I, I've heard I, that before, but were you aware that, uh, that gas masks couldn't be used by the children and infants? Mr. That, Chairman, that they had? Were if you, you would like to answer, ask any other questions, I'll be happy to wait, but I need a little bit of time to well, answer if I, I may. I have one other question I'd like to conclude with, and you could supply me the answer in writing. In reading, uh, I don't know if you read the autopsy reports, but my final question, in reading the autopsy reports of the women and children, I will always be haunted by what they contain. This past weekend, I read a physician's report recounting how he found a closed and clenched woman's hand and when he pried it open, he found the remains of an infant's hand. The doctor believed that many of the infants and children had their faces covered with wet towels because, in fact, they didn't have uh, gas masks. But after hours of gassing, undo uh, undoubtedly tortured uh, these infants before they were finally suffocated, according to the autopsy reports. Knowing this today, would you still proceed in the same manner? The Attorney General will now be given an answer to whatever extent you can. There are a lot of questions asked you. I know that that makes this very, very difficult. But take whatever time you want, and after you're done, we're going to have a lunch break, and okay. we'll come back and resume the question. But whatever time you need, please respond to Mr. Micah. Mr. Micah, I really appreciate this opportunity to respond, because as I was telling you earlier, and I want you to understand, because you, I don't think, can comprehend if you talk to me about children, the fact that this instance will be etched on my mind for the rest of my life. Those children, no matter how they were found, the fact that they are dead is a tragedy that will be with me for the rest of my life. You do not have to talk in those terms. What we have got to do is to work together to avoid such tragedies for the future. You began your comments by referring to an April the 16th meeting summary on page 271 of the book in which you likened it to Saddam Hussein, and that kind of got thrown in. I don't know quite what the reference I is. It. That's the, uh, the if comments I may... that Mr. Uh, Hyde had made earlier, and he read from the report of the Department of Justice. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I uh, do uh, may quote. You may answer as okay. fully as you desire right now. Okay. That was not in the context of a White House meeting. I think that was just thrown in. I don't know what the direct comment was, but you have to understand as we considered whether to use gas or not, the whole impact, no matter who used it, our ultimate concern was not what it looked like. Our ultimate concern was the safety of the children. Could we do it? It was at that reason when, when I got the briefing book to which you refer on April the 12th and started reading it that I had further questions about the children, about gas mask. This is the gas mask that the congressman is showing, but it's not very helpful in terms of trying to understand what happened there to just show gas mask. We've got to show the people what went into the process. And what went into the process was a dangerous situation which was getting more dangerous. What went into the process was extensive inquiry of toxicologists who consulted with others to try to find out whether this would be permanently harmful to the children. We considered absolutely everything that we could. You refer to a meeting at the White House. I don't know who was at that meeting, but I do know that I asked Webb Hubble to make sure in light of the fact that the President had asked the Acting Attorney General to advise him of a change of plans, to let him know that that was being considered. With respect to what we did to try to protect the children, our hope was that the children would come out and that obviously with the wind, with all the circumstances, the gas was not effective because there were people who went back into the 
compound. One of the agents who testified before you talked about the fact that there was no gas there when he went in to save her. All of these factors we tried to consider, but it is so important, Congressman, that as we look at it, we do it in an orderly way, not mixing up Saddam Hussein with something else. Time has expired. As I've indicated, uh, we are going to take a recess for lunch at this point for 45 minutes. There are many critical questions that have not been asked. It's quite apparent, so that everybody is fully aware of it, that we will have to have a second round of questioning. And we will continue and resume these hearings with those questions and finishing the first round, of course, first in 45 minutes. This hearing is recessed for 45 minutes. This Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. Over on our companion network, C-SPAN 2, right now, you can see the Senate Whitewater investigation. You'll see Tuesday's proceedings held by the Senate Special Whitewater Committee. Chair